I'm all you poor workers, good news to you, I'll tell how the good old union has come in here to dwell. A battle in the heart of Alabama caught our attention. Coal miners in one community, they've been on strike now for months. Working as long as 12 hours a day, seven days a week, in some of the most dangerous conditions. I really think that the labor movement is the single greatest force for democracy in the history of the United States. The story of Alabama is a story of not just resilience, but of militancy. I say no contract, you say no If we ain't all free, ain't none of us free. You're listening to Alabama's only union talk radio show, The Valley Labor Report, with Adam Keller and Jacob Morrison. Hello, Tennessee Valley. This is The Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison, here with my co-host and fellow agitator, Adam Keller, and we are broadcasting live-ish Online and on the radio uh, from the heart of the Tennessee Valley, the Spice Radio Studio in Huntsville, Alabama. The machinists in Decatur are gearing up for negotiations. A member of the bargaining committee walks us through their preparations and responds to some anti-union propaganda about union negotiations. We talk about some recent Alabama stats. We speak to a pro-labor Republican and more on today's program. Uh, If you want to be a part of the program, we've got a phone number. You can call 844-899-TVLR. That is 844-899-8857. You won't be able to join us live today because this is a pre-taped show. We pre-taped this on Tuesday afternoon uh, because we're going to be out of pocket on Saturday. But you can leave us a voicemail anytime and we'll answer it. If you haven't gotten enough of us by the time that we wrap here on the radio, or if you just want to see what we're up to throughout the week, then you can find us online anywhere you find anything. We are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we are on YouTube, wherever you listen to your podcasts, all at The Valley Labor Report. Just a reminder, your support keeps us on the air. Our single largest source of funding comes directly from our listeners. So if you want to become a sustaining member of the program, make a one-time donation, or buy our new hat, let's throw that up there for them, Adam, if you could, you can go to tvlr.fm. Navigate over to our store, get you one of those good hats, become a sustaining member of the program, make a monthly donation, all that good stuff. You can do all of that at our website, tvlr.fm, tvlr.fm. If you're a member of a union, you should get your local to sponsor the show. You can reach out to me for more details on that. Uh, So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, Terrence Ireland is running for House District 2. For Alabama House District 2, he is a Carpenters Union member. He's a firefighter, fi- uh, he's a firefighter, and he recently received the endorsement of the North Alabama Area Labor Council, a regional body of the AFL-CIO representing thousands of working people in the area, and he's re- and he is a Republican. So that's kind of interesting. We wanted to talk to him about, about his campaign as a pro-labor Republican in 2022. So he is our next guest. Guest, uh, Brother Terrence, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's start with you personally. You know, you're a union member. It's something that's important to you and important enough to you as a Republican to put on some of your publicity materials, despite the fact that, you know, being a union member uh, for a lot of people, especially in the donor class, uh, in the Republican and the Democratic parties, for that matter, uh, being a Repub- uh, being a union member will do more harm than good among a lot of those types of folks. So why is your union membership something that you're so open with? Well, I think it's, you know, we need to be transparent on what we stand for, uh, regardless of what kind of party you're running in. Um, and I know that kind of, uh, when you look at, when you kind of look at unions, a lot of people kind of look at um, more, the Democratic Party is more union friendly. Um, but as myself, as a, as a Republican, you know, I'm union friendly and I'm also a union. Um, so we see the eye on the same issues. Right, right. So the, uh, you know, when we were talking earlier, you even mentioned to me that, uh, um, 
that you were part of a unionization campaign among some contract firefighters on a military base. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, it was a military base out in the Pacific. Uh, we had tried to unionize the department. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the other other islands uh, out there, they was part of the U.S. territory. Uh, we have a military base, and the one I was uh, stationed at, we we wasn't part of a, a U.S. territory. So when we tried to we got the ball rolling, everybody was all for it. Um, we all kind of met up in the, uh, the, the attorneys kind of met in Honolulu and. It got got shot down really quick because uh, even though everybody was for it, it was it came up to it's like you know kind of outside your jurisdiction here, mm-hmm. you know your this this island this military base is on foreign soil soil, so you have no right to bargaining and, and, and credit union here. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty wild. Just because you're uh, somewhere else, you gotta give up some of your rights. That's pretty wild. Yeah, um, our, our our protected rights. You know, even though you know, I think that you know, I think that you know, we should look at you know, in the future, look at a lot of these military installations. You know, they're just because it's overseas. Um, I think we should look at some the way those the people who works on those bases, uh, def- defense contractors, Americans that's working there. Why wouldn't they be allowed to be under the same laws that back at home when they're working for the U.S. government? <laughs> Absolutely, it do- it doesn't make any sense, you know. If you're uh, especially, that's one of the things that I am I- I'm very passionate about, um, which is whenever we're spending taxpayer dollars, um, we should be you know we should be tying strings to that. We should be saying you know like look. Uh, we have certain priorities as a government, and one of those priorities is that uh, the people that work in this country have good wages, they have good benefits, they have good working conditions, and so when we contract out work, we should not allow the privatization of our uh, of government services to come at the cost of the people who do the work. You know, I mean that's and and that's often uh, you know. That's often part of the reason <laughs> that people want to privatize is yeah. because they've got some buddies that, you know, they want to cut wages and, and put the difference in their pockets. So. Absolutely. So um, what, uh, you know, you're a Carpenters Union member. Can you talk about some of, like, how that has benefited you as as a member of the union? Um, you know, some of the things that, that some of the work that you do and, and the benefits that you get as a union member? So yeah, um, so I, I entered the carpet trade uh, back in 2019. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience. I've I've been in fire protection, civil civil fire protection, for over 19 years, and most of my background is working uh, through my local community. 19 years, I worked as a volunteer firefighter, and I served as their local board director of the county fire association as the fire prevention officer. And then over seven plus years, I travel around the world, work on defense contracts through Iraq, Afghanistan, um, the Pacific area. Um, so when I, you know, when I just, when I decided to give up the defense work and come back home, um, I was kind of looking for something to do. And um, as a kid growing up, you know, my stepfather, he was a, a carpenter. He had his little carpenter business and he kind of like a handyman. So, I, you know, I had a little bit of, general knowledge i wasn't an expert by all means but you know i gave it a shot a couple of my buddies at the fire department you know they're like hey won't you join the union you know we're, we're doing carpentry work uh, you can make a good salary at it you support your family there's good benefits there's you know there you get your pension retirement all that's available to you i was like i don't know you know it's just i don't know if i got the spins it's like i'm gonna have to start back over again and uh, he's like no no the apprentice program you go through it you're you're working and you're learning and you're getting paid for it. I mean, mm-hmm. so it's not like, you know, you're going to be in a college trying to get a four year degree and you're not going to get anything while you're trying to go learn something. Um, they're going to, they're going to get you the hands-on experience and you're going to get paid for it as you work. And that, and that really, you know, kind of pushed me towards the union. And ever since I got in, I've, I've always really enjoyed it. Um, it's just, you know, the, the brothers you work with, they're all passionate about what they do and about each other. And we all get together. If somebody's, you know, sick or um, having a hard time, we all gather together and support that brother. 
Yeah, that I mean that is a underappreciated fact of uh, union membership. I think you know it's easy for us to talk about um, the better wages, the better benefits, better working conditions, you know, all that stuff because it's it's true. Uh, but there is a real sort of uh, community there, at least in a at least in a good union. There's a real sort of community there that you just uh, you're just not going to get in a non union workplace most of the time. Uh, you know, uh, bosses will want to talk about how how <laughs> how their family, but you know, really the folks that you work with, your brothers and sisters on the job, uh, they're your family. And when you you know when you're part of a union, it really helps to drive that home and, and you've got that sort of uh, that sort of community there uh, even beyond just the material things like wages and benefits and and you know basically every time that we've talked uh, you've mentioned that uh, uh, you know that your support for those folks down in Bessemer who are organizing in Amazon you know feeling like uh, you know they deserve some of the things that some of the, s- the same things that y'all do that UPS drivers make it, because of their union membership because of their organizing um, and you know that's something that you don't hear a lot from Republicans I mean uh, I talked to you earlier today about how Tupperville he has spent time actively trying to discourage these workers down in Bessemer from uh, from unionizing, you know, saying that we need to be a business friendly state. Uh, how do you how do you see that as as a Republican, you know, but somebody who believes that workers should union believe that workers deserve to be in a union, deserve the benefits that come along with that? How do you see that? as a Republican, knowing that so many of your, you know, people in the same party as you disagree on that? Well, <clears throat> no, I agree. You know, we do want to ha- be a business-friendly state, and but we also have to make sure that employees and the people working these these businesses we're trying to draw in, they have a good-paying wage, and they're able to support their family. And you can work a, you can work at a normal business and work a 40-hour job, and, and, you know, by the time you get your paycheck and you're like, you look at it and you're like, and after you've already deducted your family insurance, which is you know up there around six, seven hundred dollars for like family encourage for insurance, you you go home with nothing and you're still on you're still on you know SNAP benefits after working a forty hour job after you you know paid your your medical insurance. How can you survive on something like that? And that's not really a that's not very friendly, employee friendly. I mean, if you're if a if a if a man a hardworking man cannot support his family working a, fo- a forty hour job, and he still have to rely on the government assistance, so we I think there's a lot of times you look at the businesses and they're for profit more than taking care of their employees, and then there's a lot of people will, will blow a smoke of oh we're you know family oriented company and we love our employees, but when it comes down to the core values of what they support. Um, you'll find that their directive is definitely not for the employees. Um, I was involved in uh, some management of a of a, a local big box store one time, you know, and I felt I felt that uh that the big box store, you know, they look at them and they always make these kind of like Amazon. They have a point system. You miss so many days, or you know, you're out of there. I mean, it becomes a problem because you're. They want to say that you're, we're loving and supporting of our employees and we're family owned, but every every employee is going to have ups and downs of life. Mm-hmm. And so, one of the biggest got me is how one of my employees was uh, having to go through a hardship. He just had a uh, a, a daughter, and then she was in a needle natal care, and he was missing a lot of days. And it's understandable. I mean, who who wouldn't want to be there holding your child's hand and going through that hard time? I mean, it's an infant. And it, it got to the point where, you know, the upper man's like, yeah, he's already missed too many days. Let's get rid of him. You know, I'm like, wait a minute. This mm-hmm. guy is only – he he's the only – the only funds in his family right now is coming from him. I mean, regardless, he's not – he's missed a lot of days. He, he is making some, and we're adjusting his schedule. We're just going to kind of kick him down in the dirt some more. I mean, I thought we were—I thought we we're for the people and the employees here. Um, and it, their mentality, you know, is—you can blow a lot of smoke and say I'm—I'm I'm for your employees and we're family-oriented, but um, a lot of these it comes down to big profits, you know. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know, 
it, it's and it's so frustrating because it's so easy to just have somebody else pick up that shift or hire somebody else, you know, if somebody needs to go down to part time to bring somebody else in. Uh, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. it's just it's so easy to accommodate people's schedules. Um, and, you know, like you said, there are a lot of people, uh, a lot of a lot of businesses that, that won't even do that much for their employees, much less, you know, um, give Absolutely. them give them a good wage. So, you know, let, let's talk about, let's talk about your campaign for a little bit then. Why did you, uh, why did you decide to run for state house? So, um, I decided to run, I've, I've served my community for 19 years, um, in the volunteer service, um, fire protection, serve on our, our local fire board, and also done it for paid service for on federal contracting. So I've served my community for, for many years and I, it's about nothing about the money. I mean, a, a legislator in Alabama doesn't make a lot of money. Um, you can easily, I can easily make the same amount of money more working construction. But I feel like we need to address some of the issues in, it's facing our state, and the, my service can be better by you know the legislators trying to address those issues. And um, I feel like I can build a confidence of the people um, that I serve. I, I, Served the served this uh, community in this state for over 19 years, and that kind of pushed me in this direction to continue to serve people. Yeah, well, so what are some of the things that you'd like to uh, you'd like to push if you're elected down in Montgomery? What are some of the things that you'd like to uh, uh, to try to get done to support working people in this state? So, some of the some of the voices I've heard in, in the state. Um, I talked to one of our university professors. Um, we kind of look at some of the ways that how we treat uh, paternity leave in the state. We, we need something. Say you're a new employee. Um, you come in, you're, you, you're not eligible for FMLA because you don't have a year of service. Um, so what happens? Um, usually, going back to my big box store that I worked at, you know, you're tough luck. You know, if you ain't been here a year. You're pregnant, you're gone. Um, you're not going to take off, you know, three, four, five weeks to have your kid. Um, we need to we need to look at how we can change that. Um, make some in the state legislation. Make a little bit of protection for these for females that's going through a pregnancy. Get a little bit, if, even though they're not protected by the federal at state level, we can adopt something. Give them a little bit more protection. I, you see a lot of countries in all over the world that has like maternity leave for for women but we don't have anything in this country mm-hmm. unless you're about a year of service um and thing even is, after a year of service that's only protected unpaid leave <laughs> you know i mean yes. i i worked in a restaurant for three years and i i worked with a woman who um who had worked at that restaurant since it opened um it opened in mm-hmm. 2015 and this this happened in 2018 and she was pregnant in 2018 and she um she worked until literally the day before she gave birth. I mean, I'm talking she went into the hospital after her after she clocked out to go give birth. And then she was back at work 2 days later because you know, she's she's working at a restaurant, right? She's a she's a server. She doesn't have money. She can't she couldn't do uh, you know, e- even if she could have take an unpaid leave she couldn't afford to take unpaid leave she was a single mother so she had to come right back to work two days after giving birth i mean it's it's insane yeah yeah absolutely i was going to jump in here terrence because i just want to say i really appreciate you bringing that issue up and and jacob the story you shared is you know unfortunately that's all too common and uh Mm -hmm. i think a lot of folks may not realize that you know, of course, I'm, I'm going to bring back my public school experience. Public educators are overwhelmingly women. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that teachers are, by and large, you know, it's a female workforce. And even though teachers do earn paid sick leave, there is no maternity leave for teachers in the state of Alabama. So you're talking about a workforce that is predominantly female. You know, the majority of your teachers are going to be pregnant at some point uh but there's no paid maternity leave there and like you mentioned terrence you, you've got restrictions on f to even qualify for fmla and that's you know you hope that you have built up enough sick days but you know there are so many teachers out there who 
uh, go into debt to the sick leave bank or who end up leaving the profession, you know, either temporarily mm-hmm. or permanently. So, you know, talk, you know, we hear a lot of discussion from Montgomery about uh, rec- recruiting and retaining teachers. This is, you know, this is a key issue there. Uh, and, and it goes beyond that into the private sector, like you mentioned, Jacob, because when you have these paid leave policies and, and maternity leave policies, these folks can come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one less person you're going to have to uh, train and, and get on board with your, your company. So it just makes a lot of sense from an economic standpoint beyond the fact that it's really the right thing to do for people and, and mm-hmm. in a state that talks about family values. I mean, I, you know, you, you, you talked about that, uh, you know, that, that you reckon – you know, some uh, uh, a fella ought to be able to support his family, and and you know, if his wife doesn't uh, doesn't want to work, she would rather stay home and and raise her kids. I think that's admirable, right. and I think I think that more folks ought to have that as an option. And it's just so sad that today we don't have that. Um, w- you know, you were talking about maternity leave and, and things like that. I, I believe in New York, they've recently passed a law that. There's some combination of like a a requirement on employers to put some money into this fund and then some amount of tax dollars that go towards a paid maternity and paternity leave that that's like I don't know 60 70 percent of what you make is that is that the kind of thing that you're talking about or are you just talking about job protections like extending FMLA protections uh, beyond yes. you know I think, uh, we need, I think we need to extend the FMLA protections um, I kind of look at the also uh, our workers on compensation. Um, how many workers you have that will work an entire lifetime will never draw on unemployment because they've been employed an entire life. Um, they've paid it. You know, there's been benefits paid into them um, in case that ever happens. So w- why couldn't we as a state um, have a a bill passed that we can actually for a, for a young mother or a mother is going through a pregnancy or going or is that to give them birth, give them a little bit of protection. Um, could, could we pay for them to be off for a year? I don't know. We could start that high, but it's better than nothing. They have nothing now. They're going to be mm-hmm. home unpaid. At least give them something, you know, eight, 12 weeks of a little compensation. To, and we could, I think we could pass it through your, you could pay through the unemployment compensation. It'd be uh, something to be protected. <laughs> um, you know, it, maybe it's not the they wouldn't get the full compensation of working a, what they would make at workplace, mm-hmm. their full salary, but at least they would have something um, to help them while they're off off work. Yeah, I think that's important, and like you said, you know, it's uh, it, it's they've got nothing now. So you know, looking at e- even, e- I mean, even thirty, forty percent of their salary would be better than where we're at now, and you know, that could help somebody be able to to stay, you know, thirty, forty, fifty percent of their salary, uh, stay at home during that critical time. You know, looking at eight to twelve weeks uh, after after the birth of their child, I think that's that's you know a critical time in development, and and you know, it, it'd be helpful for the child and the mother. I think. What about, um, you know, you're obviously a supporter of unions and and, you know, we know that that unions are a good way for workers to bring up their wages and working conditions themselves. Um, You mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, you were interested in in the PRO Act on, on a national level. What kind of things do you think on a state level could be done to um make it more easier for workers to organize to make it more difficult for bosses to interfere in that process some of the, some of the things i think we need to look at is when we do capital projects is funded by taxpayer money um where it be a coliseum or you know a bridge or infrastructure upgrades whatever you're using taxpayer money and you're you know that where you're taking that taxpayer money from whether it be a, a ad valium tax or um a tobacco tax, you know, the people those taxes are paid for, the local people, um, why shouldn't they Why sh- shouldn't they be allowed to build that project, use a local workforce, um, allow how, allow them the opportunity to, to bargain for their collective wages, you know, um, because they're the one that's building that. I mean, that their money, and what it, their, it's their tax, their money is building that project. Um, I think when you look at that, anything over, you know, a certain percentage 
um, we're gonna have to look at a dollar figure here. It needs to be competitive bid out, but also needs um, that you labor agreement in there where they can bargain on their agreement on the terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a there's a bill that has been. Um that's been introduced this year and last year, a quote-unquote anti-riot bill that would allow um, the police to arrest people for quote-unquote rioting, even if they haven't uh, damaged any property or hurt anybody, uh, held for 24 hours before conviction, held in prison, uh, held in jail for 30 days if they're convicted of rioting. Um, it would, uh, you know, the, lots, that's one of the most damaging things. And, but the, that just passed the state house a couple of weeks ago. Where uh, where would you stand on a bill like that? So I was reading the bill, and I think there's a lot of loopholes in there. Um, I think you know, as general, when it was passed, um, it may have met good, but you didn't. There's too many loopholes, and there need, there needs to be fixed before that because a lot of innocent people are going to be affected by that. Um, just by looking at the bill. It's kind of it's kind of it's kind of like a double edged sword. Um, you need to protect one side so nobody get, both sides doesn't get cut. You know, if you we understand the aspect of trying to protect the property um, in a city from violent protests. And when I say violent, we we need to look at who's involved in the protest that's making the violent. Uh, we can't just generally say the entire crowd is a violent protester. Any mm -hmm. any fruit loop would just join walk into the crowd and say I'm part of the protest, but your actions of that person doesn't affect the rest of the protesters. So right. the bill needs to, we need to, I think it's premature. The bill is being proposed. There needs to be reworked a little bit more, some, some fine language needs to be put in there. So we make sure we're not fridge on the, the protesters rights. That's not, they're innocent. Yeah, I, I, w I would, I would agree that, that I don't support it, but I would, I would say that I would actually be interested in going in the opposite direction. I think that, you know, as we are moving towards instituting constitutional carry in Alabama, making it easier to, um, to concealed carry without a permit, uh, you know, I don't think that I'm necessarily opposed with that. I think that we should also move towards, uh, making it easier to speak in Alabama, you know, so we're going to be, if constitutional carry passes the state Senate, we're going to be in a place where we can carry a gun without a permit, but if I want to speak, downtown i still have to get, have a permit i mean i think that's totally backwards <laughs> i think we should move towards yes, yes, um exactly you know, right. I, yeah i i think that we should be moving towards a uh, you know maybe a constitutional speech bill where we say that you know it, it's easier for it's make it easier for people to speak you know i i uh, i know that this is way down in another uh, on basically the other side of the state but our brothers and sisters in brookwood have been on strike for almost a year now and they have had basically the entire time an injunction set on them where they can only have so many people on the picket line at first it was 10 then it was 6 then it was 5 then they banned it completely for months now they can only have two people on a picket line. I mean, that's just insane. And that's the government saying, you know, this is the state government coming in and restricting the rights of our citizens to uh, to speak and assemble. And, you know, that uh, I, I think that we should be moving in totally the opposite direction from this anti-riot bill. Um, so, you know, you, you, you're obviously, you know, you're Pro union, you're pro pro worker. You're interested in in you know making the wages and working conditions better for workers in Alabama, but you know we we just talked about this anti riot legislation. Republicans in Montgomery, it seems to me, seem dead set on putting these sort pushing these sort of divisive culture war issues like you know saying. Black Lives Matter protesters are bad, and we, and, you know, they're scary, and 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 all this stuff. Talking about abortion, CRT, criminalizing protest. How are you going to push your caucus, the Republican caucus, if you get elected, to focus on these bread and butter issues about wages and working conditions and how our tax money is allocated, and address them in favor of working people? instead of trying to divide us on these other issues or even making things worse for working people on these uh, economic issues, how are you going to get, how, how, how will you push your caucus to, you know, to help working folks in Alabama? So um, all those things are very important issues and this has been addressed on the state level and the national level. And 
and when and as a legislator and I think the general public and the society would view, um, you have to take time to look at both point of views on that. Um, if you if you start look pushing one point, um, you're, you're you're going to make someone else mad on the other point. You know, on the on the issues like that, um, we need to focus on moving forward about protecting workers. And is is the, is these actions here? Are they are they how are they infringing on the in the workers itself? Um, I want to I like to address you know the the issues that comes up the most. Uh, there's a lot of CRT theories out there, um, and I believe you know that in a general perspective, um, they should be able to express their views, um, just like any other free speech. But um, at one at some point, um, where, how, where does it go? Where it can't be tolerated anymore. Um, we need to we need to look at those and say, hey, you know, these people need to be able to express their views, just like we can express our views against those. And we need to be neutral in those in those conversations. All right, how, uh, but but the the what I meant to ask. Sorry if I I didn't. How, how are you going to you know because it it seems to me that there is such a focus on those issues. At the detriment, at the at the exclusion of these other bread and butter issues, how, uh, of of you know wages and working conditions, and and helping uh, you know helping make sure that you know workers have the freedom to organize. How are you going to you know keep people on track, basically, because there is such a there is such an interest in these in these you know issues that don't have a material effect on people's lives i think how do you think that uh, you know do you do you have any um you know uh, and, and it is a long way away but do you have any ideas about how you would keep your caucus uh, keep the people that you're elected with on track on the important issues that are going to actually affect working people yeah so the, one of my, my biggest things i want to push is kind of upgrading a infrastructure in the state and we want to make sure that those are priority. Um, there's a lot of issues in the state, like the CRT, the religion. Um, but what, what at the at the end of the day, what matters the most is the people that's going to be building this infrastructure, protecting their rights. That's the ones we need to protect. And also, that's that's what when they're building these structures, their income. That's at the end of the day, they get a paycheck and they be able to support their family, regardless of if there's a protest over here. Um, they can still they're still protected all right uh terrence i appreciate your time thank you very much for talking to us all right thank you all right that was terrence ireland he is running for state house district two in the muscle shoals limestone county area it kind of uh his district overlaps those there um so we've been talking to him about his campaign uh and we're going to go ahead and take a break really quick and up next we're going to be talking to chris mullins a bargaining committee member of the machinist local 44 in decatur about preparing for contract negotiations you're listening to the valley labor report stay tuned Support for this program also comes from the Iron Workers, Local 477. So if you are looking for contractors with lower than average EMR and TRIR, uh, they tell me that if you need to know what those mean, then you will. Uh, or if you need to supplement a workforce at any level for any amount of time, short or long term, if you need iron workers that come trained and certified at no extra cost, or if you need workers from superintendent down to general laborer, and you're looking to start work on a project or you're unhappy with your current contractor situation, you need to call my friend Jeb Miles with the Ironworkers Local 477. They only work with the best in the business, vetted contractors, and can do all kinds of jobs from roofing to steel and bridge erection, from welding to heavy rigging, from structural repairs to machinery alignment, and much more. They supply manpower on four of the five largest projects in North Alabama, so you know they're legit. If you need good quality, safe, efficient, diligent, and knowledgeable workers on your job, then you need the Iron Workers Local 477. Call Jeb Miles at 256-383-3334 or via email at local477 at bellsouth.net and make sure you tell them that you heard about them on the Valley Labor Report. IBW 558 is like a great football team. You've got to have the aptitude, skills, and knowledge to outperform the competition. 
If you're a non-union electrician, now is the perfect time to get off the sideline and join our team. We have the absolute best wages and benefit package in North Alabama and Southern Tennessee. It's because our team stands together, bargains together, and our families benefit from it. With immediate openings, you have the opportunity to see why the IBW is the right choice. Energy Alabama is a locally operated and membership-based nonprofit organization focused on advancing Alabama's clean energy future through education and advocacy. Many people in charge of infrastructure and building decisions simply don't know how viable clean and renewable energy is, and to that end, Energy Alabama has provided instruction to thousands of adults and tens of thousands of K-12 students across the state, and they are working hard to build careers in clean energy and help everyday Alabamians save money on their utility bills. Learn more about their work and how you can join at energyalabama.org. Support for the Valley Labor Report comes from the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers Union. Learn more by visiting www.ifpte.org. The attorneys of Maples, Tucker, and Jacobs are proud to represent working people in Alabama and across the Southeast. They have over 100 years of experience representing injured workers in workers' compensation, personal injury, and disability claims. Let their attorneys help you when you get injured on the job. You can find them at www.mtandj.com or 855-617-617. 9333. Let Maples, Tucker, and Jacobs help you when you get injured on the job. Again, the website is www.mtandj.com or the phone number 855 617 9333. No representation is made that the quality of legal services is greater than the quality of legal services from other law firms. Support for this program comes from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 136, out of Central Alabama. Learn more at IBEW136.org. Come on, you poor workers, good news to you, I'll tell how the good old union has come in here to dwell. Labor creates all wealth. All wealth should go to labor. You are listening to the Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison, and my co-host is Adam Keller. If you have anything to add to the program, you can give us a call. The phone number is 844-899-TVLR. That is 844-899-8857. This is a pre-tape. You won't be able to join us live, but you can leave us a voicemail, and we'll answer it on the next program. We've been talking to Terrence Ireland. He is running for House District 2, uh, State House District 2 in Alabama, about his campaign, about his union membership, and uh, what he wants to do for working people in the state. Up next, we are talking to Chris Mullins, Machinist Local 44 member and part of their negotiating committee about their preparations for contract negotiation. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. So, um... The uh, the United Launch Alliance is a rocket manufacturer in North Alabama, in Decatur, and they've got a stellar success rate. None of their rockets have launched unsuccessfully, and that is thanks to the efforts of the workers who are organized into the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local Lodge 44. We've been talking to them a lot over the last few months about ULA's vaccine mandate, their success in retaining membership, and uh, they're coming up on uh, contract negotiations. So I thought it'd be good to talk uh, to one of the folks on their bargaining committee about that. So, Chris, let's start with this. Can you tell us how you were selected to be on the committee? I was nominated by my brothers and sisters and uh, an election was held and I was part of the group of five to win. And that's how I was selected. So, uh a big bad union boss from across the country didn't come in and uh, and and tell you who's going to be on the committee. <laughs> Absolutely not. Our brothers and sisters select our committee. And and so you are you're 
you're a worker. You're, you're not somebody that is a staff with a union. You're, you're somebody who works at United Launch Alliance in Decatur, right? Yes, I am. What do you do at work? I'm a aerospace technician. I'm, right now, I'm currently working on the uh, new development of uh, Vulcan for ULA. So, um, building the avionics and propulsion systems. Awesome. Very cool. A lot, a uh, lot smarter than me. I can tell you that. Uh, so, uh, so walk us through preparing for negotiations. You know, you're elected. What happens next? What does that look like? Well, we're elected. Um, we're sent to Florida for training for a week to prepare with the other sites, other members of uh, the negotiating committee, which for you, for the local lodge I, with the IAM, we have the launch sites in California and launch site in Florida. And us here in Decatur, all three of us will be together negotiating our contract here in about 30 days. What do you learn at the at the training? Actually, they put us through some pre-negotiating um, test test runs. We actually have someone come in and pretend to be the company, and we're working through our processes, how we get proposals, how we communicate doing doing all that. We're learning about the economic side of it. Uh, the writing language side of it. All that, they put us through that training in that one week. Um, but that's what we did in Florida this this past September. That is, I have always thought that is one of the coolest things about, uh, about union membership is being able to actually write the language that you're going to be working under. Um, especially since, you know, so many people feel like, you know, contract language is the domain of lawyers and that, you know, normal working folk, you know, we're just not smart enough to understand that kind of stuff. Can you speak to the the actual drafting of, of the contract language, like, as as a working person? You know, what, uh, like, I'm. it's not really that, I mean, you know, there are things that you need to learn, but it's something that everybody could do, right? Um, for our contracts, it is better if we're the, the actual team members. I was a, a former shop steward. It is a lot better if the, if the team members can understand the language. Now, if you had mm -hmm. a lawyer writing this language, if you've ever tried to read a mortgage contract or something like that, there's <laughs> a lot of crazy stuff in there that doesn't need to be in there. A lot of stuff mm -hmm. we don't understand. But if we are part of that process, writing the language, it would help our members understand it. And therefore, when they have issues, we can talk our way through it instead of, like I said, trying to muddle through lawyer speak. And right. uh, it's not easy. Like I said, we went through the training in September. We're striking proposals right now for our negotiations coming up in 30 days. And, you, you know, it's, it's easy to think, but well, we'll just write this in. You no, know, every word, every detail, you have to kind of be calculated. And do I think any one of our members could do it? Absolutely, with the proper training. But that, that's one of the reasons we don't have lawyers all over the place sitting with us, you know, wordsmithing every, every letter that comes across the table. I mean, for us, it's got to be where our members understand this contract. Right. How do you put together your list of priorities? You know, you, you you know, everybody, every workplace is going to be a little bit different. There are going to be some people who some some workplaces, maybe they feel good with the pay and they want more time off. Maybe some places uh, they're really upset about the pay. And so they want, you know, the raise is their top priority. How do you decide what to go hardest for at the bargaining table? Well, this is my first time being on the negotiating committee and how we decided to make those decisions were through employee surveys. And we actually did two, and we reviewed all the surveys, and we used whatever the highest percentage of the uh, actions that our members wanted. That's how we rate rank them, and of course, everything that we found through the surveys, we really don't believe we'd be able to discuss during negotiations. We're only going to be gone two weeks, 
So we got to prioritize, you know, and, and probably we got 10 proposals, top proposals that we have to do that were ranked the highest through the surveys. And that's how we accomplished it. Right, right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like we said, the members uh, the members have a say in that. So that's, you know. Absolutely. Uh, strike preparations go right along with bargaining preparations. Uh, you know, obviously strikes are a last resort, but can you speak to why it's important to be prepared to strike, even if, you know, y'all y'all would hope it's not necessary. You know, it would be great if you go to the company with the things that their workers need and the company's like, okay, yeah, this sounds reasonable. Because I know y'all aren't going to the table saying we want, you know, a thousand dollars an hour, right? Y'all are coming up with things that are reasonable, that you know that the company could provide, uh, and that would be good good for the workers. And so, in an ideal world, the company would say, "Okay, yeah, these are these are reasonable proposals. Let's go ahead and go with that." But we know that we do not live in an ideal world, and so <laughs> sometimes sometimes you can come to an impasse. So, why is it important to prepare for a strike, even if you hope you don't have to? Well, you don't want to. Uh, our our boat is on a Sunday, and strike starts that midnight, that Monday morning. You don't want to be getting signs, getting bases of operations, getting a strike committee, uh, a PR committee. Uh, you don't want to be preparing for those things the week before. We as a negotiating committee, we are on those things right now. Uh, strike committee, line captains, base of operations, all those things have to be being put in place now. Because like I said, if you wait to the week of, it's too late. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what the unorganization of it is discouraging to your people for one and not being prepared. And that... Um, you can't have it because it's a difficult time because we went on strike four years ago and we were prepared. Uh, but once again, the mindset changes for everybody in the body once you go on strike. And if, if the members see that the leadership isn't prepared, it's disheartening and it, and it makes it difficult for them to follow you. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I it would be difficult for me to follow an unorganized leadership into a strike, knowing that, you know, I'm going to be forfeiting a lot of my pay. Obviously you get, you know, you get strike checks, but that's not going to be the same as, as your check from work. And so, you know, you have to be, um, if not just for morale, you, you know, you have to be Absolutely. organized and, and you have to know what you're doing. Can you talk to us about what what do those things mean? Strike captain, base of operations. You know, we have a lot of people in the audience that are that um, that are union members, but we also have a lot of people in the audience that are not union members. What are the what do those things mean? OK, strike captain, strike committee. Like when we go on strike at midnight, who's going to be there? Who's assigning shifts? Who's going to be in charge of the the uh, people at the line and the way we did it last time, we were four hour shifts. And of course, some people don't participate. And, you know, some do, and you still got to man the lines 24 hours, you know, every day. So you got to have somebody in charge to make sure that stays organized as well. And right. having a base of operations, you know, we got to have somebody preparing food just in case someone is in that has a need for it. Somebody has to be in charge of those community services. Um, once again, lunch and food being prepared for the people out on the line. That's another assignment assigned to, to someone else. Um, like I said, it, it's, it's several, you know, the, election committee, strike committee, the picket line committee, it is several different committees. And some of them, and for our group, uh, are being combined because it'd be easier to work at work it that way. Um, but it, it, as far as that, the strike and the, the picket committee, all this being handled right now and we're preparing for it. 
Right, right. How does your union decide to go on strike? Let's say that, you know, you get to the table and the company says, you know, no, we're not interested in, in giving you these, uh, you know, these reasonable requests that you're making. Um, how, how do you actually mechanically um, make the decision as a union to go on strike? Well, the, what we do, uh, like I said, we're, April 8th, we're going to negotiations. We will be back April 25th. And that following Sunday, we as a negotiating committee will have our whole body together. We'll read over the contract, especially the changes from the previous contract. And we as a negotiating committee will give our recommendation. And after that point, all three sites, all three sites will be doing this at the same time. And after that point, we as a group will vote. Number one, uh, yes or no on the contract. And then there's another vote to strike or no strike. I know it's kind of confusing having both of those votes, but that's the way we do. Mm -hmm. Right. Part of right. Our bylaws. Yeah. So and, uh, here again, it's not some big, scary union boss from across the country coming and telling your workers, your members, to strike or not. It's y'all making that decision, right? No, sir. No, sir. Our negotiating committee, us five members, we uh, when we leave negotiations, we will have a recommendation when we leave Florida and whether the, to vote this contract in or to vote it down. And all five of us will have the same message. And all five of us will be speaking. The aerospace coordinator, he will be there, but we will be speaking to the child members. And then they'll be making the decision whether they want to accept the contractor uh, or not and whether to go on strike or not. Absolutely. Adam, did you have any questions for him about uh, their preparations for negotiations? No, I just wanted to chime in to, you know, thank you for joining. And I also wanted to just share with the audience, like, if you had any questions about how a union can operate democratically, how working class folks can get together as a group and do amazing things, just listen to what Chris told us tonight. Uh, I, I think that's a powerful testimony on how workers can come together and can do it democratically to to improve their lives and, and the lives of their families and their community. So I, I'm just wishing you and all your brothers and sisters a very, very successful contract negotiation. Uh, and we hope that we can have some of y'all come on very soon to share good news about yeah. your contract. That's what I hope. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so we're talking right now to Chris Mullins. He's a bargaining committee member of the Machinist Local Lodge 44 in Decatur, uh, representing workers at the United Launch Alliance, about their preparations for contract negotiations. And now, Chris, uh, let's turn to uh, to more general things about union negotiations. I mentioned this to you, and you said that you're good with it. Um, we have a clip that Hershey's is showing to their employees in Virginia who are voting on whether or not to unionize here in the next month. And uh, this is a video that is that talks about uh, union negotiations. And, um, and so we're, it, it's, it's six minutes, so we're going to watch and react with you. Um, before we start, though, did, did, were you able to take a look at it uh, before the show, and, and did, did you have any thoughts about it? Yes, sir. Uh, I've seen something similar to that. When I worked for a company called Sunoco Products, we were trying to organize, and they played us a video of something similar, and it's disgusting, and everything in it is a lie. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, it should be against the law for a company to play that to employees about unions because it is not correct. Amen. Yep. Amen. Well, I think that's a the, that's a good uh, that's a good intro to it. So, <laughs> Adam, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and watch the clip. All right. Jamie's dad asks her where she wants to go for her birthday dinner. She suggests the pricey seafood restaurant with the all-you-can-eat platter. Dad isn't too concerned about the price. 
but he's allergic to shellfish. He suggests the nice steakhouse that has a few seafood options, but mom isn't a big fan of either choice. She reminds everyone that Jamie's new braces have tightened up the family budget. They compromise and go to the Chinese buffet. Nobody is very happy with how things turned out. Welcome to the process of negotiation. Collective bargaining, the technical name for negotiating a union contract, brings the interests of three parties to the okay, negotiating let's, table. Let's the union, stop that right there the really company, quick. And the employees. Just like Jamie's birthday dinner negotiation, each of these th So and and if and if you could re rewind it uh sure. before uh, when when we start back. The first thing that they do there is they show, you know, that they talk about that in negotiations there are going to be compromise and this this is presented as if it's like an argument against negotiations like like what is the what is the alternative to nego negotiating your contract as a worker it's being told what it's going to be and getting less as a worker right i mean Absolutely. that's the, just just the idea that okay you're not going to get everything you want well not getting everything you want is better than getting nothing that you want i mean that's just it's absurd it's also like as if you've never had to compromise as an individual worker without right. a union <laughs> i mean every job i've ever had i had a hell of a lot of compromises on my part yeah uh, way more than the boss made so uh, i feel like i'm not unique in that it, it, yeah, it's it's weird to see negotiation being a scary or, or damning kind of process <laughs> when there is no alternative there. Yeah, uh, I mean the alternative is getting. I mean the alternative is getting nothing. If you are not negotiating collectively, then you are getting what the boss gives you. Well, now hold on, Jacob. You could kiss a lot of rear <laughs> and maybe you get in good with your supervisor and maybe. you can get something that everybody else doesn't get that's uh, true that's left unsaid <laughs> yeah but if you're a union everybody gets their fair share should should be getting a fair share right and i, I i've been in that room where i get called you know a non-union company we get called in a big room they tell us what your your benefits are what your raise is and it's exactly what they think it should be. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a say. And now I have a say. And there's right. a difference. Right. And we're not yeah. trying yeah. to strip the company of everything that they earn. We're not looking for that. We've never looked for it like that. We just want our fair share. Right. And so you're telling me, Chris, that it's better to get some of what you want than nothing and be dictated totally everything about your workplace? Well, it, it's better to have a say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. Let's uh, let, let's let's go ahead and keep playing the clip. Bargaining, the technical name for negotiating a union contract, brings the interests of three parties to the negotiating table: the union, the company, and the employees. Just like Jamie's birthday dinner negotiation, each of these three parties comes with a list of things they hope to get from the process. Okay, let's stop right there. So, Chris, you just walked us through how you create as the negotiating committee how you create your list but these this video is trying to make it seem like the union is a set there there's an implicit Absolutely. third partying of the union here but the union is they're, they're just the workers divide. absolutely they're, they're trying to divide the members uh, well, they try to the prospective members. They try to divide them already, and mm -hmm. in our group, I can't. This is the only union I've ever been in. The employees and the union are one and the same. We don't have. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Our business rep, he's rarely in town. We deal with the company on grievances. We write our own grievances, and yes, if it gets to a certain level, it does have to go to the business rep, and so on and so. If it goes to arbitration, of course, we have to deal with the business rep. But it's it's us. The technicians, the elected stewards handling these issues, and even in negotiations, it's us. It's right. us five, launch site technicians. We're the one writing proposals. We're the one communicating with the members. And that, those surveys, that communication, that is what we're taking into negotiation. 
And yeah. that, that video, like I said, it should be against the law for them to play videos like this to prospective uh, uh, bargaining unit members. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's just it, it's totally disgusting. Uh, let's let's keep playing it. Collective <laughs> bargaining is the story of these three lists. The best way to understand collective bargaining is to consider where these three lists come from and to look at what happens to the items on those lists during negotiations. One is the employee's wish list. These are the things they told the union organizer they want to be different about their jobs. This list might include things like more pay and better benefits, work schedules, and even things like job security and workload. To get workers excited about all the possibilities with collective bargaining, the organizers ask workers to make the list of the things they want. This is a sales tactic intended to make workers feel like they will be in control and to believe they will get everything on their wish list. Okay, let's, yeah. I, I'm anticipating eagerly uh, how the employer <laughs> handles this. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just curious how the employer gets the input of the employees and their wish list. And, I mean, I, surely it wouldn't be just a sales tactic. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and I mean, no union member or union organizer or anybody in any union is going to tell you that unionizing is going to get you every single thing that you want for. Like, I'm not going to go and right. tell somebody that is looking to unionize, like, in, what anything that you want, you can get it and you can get it on your first contract. Like, that's just not that's not how it works. And nobody is saying that's how it works. But you can get some of it. List Every employer, every employee in every job has that list. And it's right. just not yeah. realistic to go after stuff like that. So uh, <laughs> as being on the negotiating committee, I've had people come to me and, you know, say, hey, get us more vacation time. Get, get you know, get us, you know, younger people come. Hey, get us topped out fast. Of course, you try to work those things into the contract, but there are other language issues that has to be worked in as well. And as a negotiating committee, we, like I said, we prioritizing and we communicate that priority with the people. It's not just us mm -hmm. five guys on the committee saying we're going to do this and do that without communicating. No, right. we have a plan. We communicate that plan with the body, and that's how we move forward in negotiation. Right. And then, I mean, even as a last resort, you know, if if for some reason the workers who elected you and the workers who participated in the survey um, and, you know, the, the workers who helped you prioritize, if, if for some reason you they get the contract back and they don't agree with the prioritization, they can always vote it down and tell you to go back and, re, and redo it. Absolutely. And, and that's 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 our thing. If if you do not like at the end of the day when you go vote and i know whatever the negotiating committee decide people still have that choice when they go vote just like any election mm -hmm. if you don't like it vote no i've done it i've yep. voted on contracts after being told hey you should vote for this because it was something in there that i did not, I did not like i mean as far as them trying to take seniority rights away. They do little mm -hmm. things to do that. Them uh, making us pay more for health insurance. Mm -hmm. They do little things, you know, that people don't realize they're doing it by increasing, giving you a raise here, but then increasing medical costs here. Well, that's a pay cut. And right. you got to take a look at this. Other things in there besides that little punch list uh, this company put up there for you to, for, for us to look at. It's, it's just a lot more. Right. I mean, even if the folks, even if the fo if the folks get the contract back and they disagree with you, you know, you ain't got a gun pointed to their head. <laughs> they can they can vote the opposite way that you recommend, and that's that's fine. Absolutely. That's nobody's going to come after them. Nobody's going to tell them they can't be a member of the union. And if they, uh, you know, if they have enough of a campaign around it, they can vote. They'll uh, the membership can vote the contract down, and you can go back to the table. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's go ahead. And, and if they're still salty about it, you know what? They can vote for new people. Yep. Uh, to run for office, uh, they can vote for new people to <laughs> be on the committee. 
They can do it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> they absolutely. can run themselves. I, I mean, in, <laughs> it'd be easier to win one of those elections than uh, uh, oh, yeah. win a political election. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, and I think uh, <laughs> all three of us have had conversations with members where, you know, the members with the loudest complaints and gripes, mm. it's like, hey, you're going to be on the committee now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> clearly, you're very passionate. You've got you've got the yeah. energy here. Uh, you care about this, so yeah. Appreciate your complaints. Now you get to be on the committee and, and address it. Yep. Let's and go you ahead. Never and have keep to pl- worry about it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep the going. Companies with list will focus on retaining flexibility and controlling costs. Okay, hold the on. The companies they- list is going to focus on. What retaining flexibility and lowering costs? Huh. Hmm. Wonder. I wonder what who that means. That comes. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what the English translation of that is. The English translation of that is less protections on the job for workers and uh, lower wages. That and higher health care costs for the workers. That's the that's the English translation for that non that for that yep. new speak there. <laughs> Even if right, there are no ahead. changes to pay and benefits, a union will increase the costs of running its business. These new costs include things like legal expenses, lost management time for bargaining, contract administration, handling grievances, and time spent on union business. Okay, the let's stop will- right there just really quick. They mentioned that uh, a loss of business is going to be um, handling grievance, even if there's no pay or, or benefit increases. You only get a grievance if you violate the contract. I mean, you're not, <laughs> you know, just follow the contract and you're not going to have any problems with right. your employees. And if you're, if it's a frivolous grievance that an employee has filed, well, guess what? It's not going to take long to win. It will not take long. You probably don't even have to pay your lawyers to handle it. Yeah. Uh, that is such BS. Uh, I, I mean, in every one of those issues involves workers being able to address issues on the job site so the alternative again is to have no uh Mm -hmm. method of addressing any issues if you're being harassed on the job uh if you're being cheated out of overtime pay if you've been denied vacation time oops deal with it wouldn't want to spend company time on a grievance Uh, that's just follow the contract you won't have to worry about it absolutely yep absolutely exactly Exactly. I have a list of proposals to make sure that it continues to manage the business, to maintain quality, take care of customers, and respond to changing business conditions so it can remain competitive and provide good jobs. Most companies insist on a management rights clause to confirm the union will not contest the company's right to make all decisions related to operations of the business, things like staffing, products, work processes, and others. I'm just going to stop it here to say... Uh, and I'm not trying to put any union down by any means, but uh, I personally don't think we even should give them those rights. <laughs> uh, you know, if, it, if the workers are the yeah. ones creating the value of the company, if it is their labor that creates the profits of the company, mm-hmm. then I don't think it's unreasonable that they should also have some say, say so in, in the operations. Right. And, and now I'm not trying to say that, you know, our, our machinist brothers and sisters are trying to tell them how to build the rockets necessarily or how many rockets. Uh, I get that. But the fact that that's even taken as a given in our country is mm-hmm. pretty extreme, really. If you start yeah. to think about it, why shouldn't we have some say so in operations and staffing? Right. Who else knows when you're short staffed, but the people on the line dealing with it, having to pick up the slack. Yeah. But I'll, even I'll... <laughs> even given that, though, even given that, again, what is the alternative? The alternative to a management rights clause where the employer has the uh, total say over what to produce and and when to produce and how much and and all the and and hiring and these sorts of things is uh that they get total say over everything right yeah that management <laughs> rights are, are management unending. rights are everything yeah yeah so, and chris you feel free to feel free to tell them to stop uh, uh, as well if there's something <laughs> that you want to uh, if there's something a point that you want to make no you you guys 100 percent right with uh they don't know staffing needs Mm-hmm. They mismanage so much. They would be better to let the technician. I, I'm just speaking for ULA. 
we know the production aspect, not an right. HR leader that right. sits in the office, mm-hmm. doesn't want to communicate with nobody out on the floor, but, you know, she wants to make, he or she wants to make decisions from an office and makes things worse. And that's how grievances get written. Yep. Right. Man, okay. So, yeah. management I- rights sucks. <laughs> yeah, man, there you go. Yeah, and I mean, I think you know, you you said that you're speaking for ULA. I think that you could pretty, I think you could pretty confident confidently say you speak for any workplace because yeah. every workplace that I've ever worked at, uh, the people who do the work know better how much people need to be there to get the work done right. and to get the work done in a timely and uh, quality manner. You know, I think that that's a pretty ubiquitous complaint. I mean, that's the a huge reason that we're seeing so many people in healthcare unionized right now is because their boss either has no idea how many nurses you need to actually staff a hospital and staff it well, or they don't care. They don't care at all, and they just want profits. And I'm I'm inclined towards the latter, but either way, there's a huge staffing problem in healthcare right now, and that's a big reason that you know. So yeah, management rights suck. The third list is the unions. Before we get to this list, it is important to remember how a union changes the relationship between the workers and their company. If a union is voted in, the union becomes the exclusive representative of the employees to the company the union will try to negotiate a contract with the company. Although workers may be asked to approve or reject a contract, the contract is between the union and the company, not between the company and the employees. Hmm. The union's top priority is uh, important to understand. (laughs) Who the hell is the contract for? Yeah, do you, you, uh, any comments on, any comments on that, Chris? (laughs) Like I said, total ridiculous. I mean, the employees and union, they're the same thing. Mm-hmm. It is in Decatur, and right. it is yeah. in Vandenberg, and it is in you know the Cape. I mean, and I mean, what does so it even ridiculous. what does it even mean if the the you know the contract is between the union and the employer? Oh, but workers have total say to vote to vote the contract down. I mean, what is it? What yeah. what kind of nonsense is that? Eve, uh, yeah, it, just, it just doesn't follow, right? Um, I, I think I think it's one of those where they just try to barrage you. I mean, at, at the same stuff that hope it, some of it sticks in your brain. Along the same lines, we could say that uh, the corporation, you know, we can use ULA as an example. Oh well, you know, ULA as a corporation is getting between my me and my relationship with Tony Bruce or whatever the hell his name is, the CEO of ULA. <laughs> ULA <laughs> is is because ULA is this corporate entity in the same way that the union is the organized group of workers, you know. We wouldn't say that ULA is getting between me and my relationship with the boss. That's nonsense. ULA is the boss. Yeah, I tell you what, as a school teacher, I had assistant principals getting in the way of me talking to my principal, who got in the way of me talking to HR, <laughs> who got in the way of me talking to deputy superintendents, who got in the way of me talking to the superintendent. Oh, and, oh by the way, we couldn't talk to the school board members who put the superintendent in there. So, mm. yeah, don't give me this crap about the union coming in between anybody. And yeah. you know what? And like you say, Chris, you can testify to how it is in Decatur. If it's not that way in your union, in your your environment, mm-hmm. then that's an issue for you to organize around and to make your union better and make it as democratic as it needs to be for you and your brothers and sisters. It's not right. it's not a, a reason to just throw out your union or unionization mm-hmm. overall. Because uh, even if even in the most undemocratic unions, you still elect your local president. Right. It's still more democratic than a non union right. workplace. Even sure. even a yeah, even a mm-hmm. mediocre or a bad union is right. generally going to be better than none at all. You you always elect your local officers and you never elect your boss. And for me, I mean right. that's the that's the to- that's the end of the discussion is yeah. that, you know, you have control even if maybe it's not optimal, even if maybe it's not as much as you would want. You know, there obviously because unions are human institutions, humans are flawed. There's going to be flawed iterations and 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 there's going to be flaws in every union and and so you can always make it better. But the fundamental thing is you elect your local officers, you get to approve or not approve your contract, and you don't get to elect your boss. 
You don't get to, and in a non-union workplace, you don't get to have any say in your working conditions. And so, you know, that's that's it as far as I'm concerned. But let's keep going with the clip. <laughs> it is a business. It must protect its own interests. The union's interests have nothing to do with what workers want. To make money, the union collects money from its members. To make sure it gets paid, the union will propose a dues checkoff clause. This clause means union dues or fees are deducted from workers' paychecks, just like taxes. The union will also ask for... Oh, and charitable contributions and, and any number of other things that you can do at just about any damn workplace. Mm -hmm. You can put money in a college savings account out of your paycheck. You can put money to United Way out of your paycheck. It, any place I'm familiar with that did offer payroll deduction for union dues, that's the way it was. So, you know, yeah. it's it's not some, you know, far-fetched idea uh, or some kind of special little privilege. And as if it's even like a difficult thing to implement. Right. Like it's not. It's, not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not. As someone who was kind of involved Listen, in that I, for school districts. The way I explain mm -hmm. it to, to people, if the dues come up, we got organizing, we got education that's available to all our members. We do community outreach. Our dues pay for those things. Our dues pay for getting prepared for strikes. Mm -hmm. Our dues pay for getting training for negotiations. Those things are important. Without yeah. those things, yeah. we would not be able to do nothing that we're going to do here in 30 days. And that is sit down and negotiate a good contract a, between the company and your, our brothers and sisters to continue to be a rockets. If we didn't have those dues, you would not be able to do this. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. That's right. For super seniority, so its leaders are the last people to get laid off, regardless of their skill or time employed. The union will also ask. That okay, its let's be stop given on the super seniority. Super seniority, and I was talking to David about this. Um, for one, again, its leaders, the union's leaders, are elected. Okay, so if you don't want somebody having super seniority, you can give it. You you can vote to give it to somebody else. But su super seniority seems to me and and David even even disagreed with me a little bit cuz he he doesn't David is the local president. He doesn't have super seniority. And I think that it would not be unreasonable for the local president and for the stewards to have super seniority because I could imagine a scenario where a a boss is really going after the union's leadership. But some yes. but 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 look Having here had that happen to me right. personally as a member of a bargaining team an executive board, mm -hmm. um, it absolutely can result in retaliation. And it seems like common sense that if you're in a position that can be adversarial with the company, it shouldn't have to be, but it can be, mm -hmm. or you're in a position where you're, you're advocating you're, you're fighting for, for your coworkers. You're right. You should have maybe some extra protection. But right. here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. I mentioned that David disagreed with me a little bit on this, and... Uh, they don't have super seniority. The machinists don't have, they don't bargain for super seniority for anybody except the negotiating team because the negotiating team is the people that uh, that interpret the contract and so they need those folks around and so they don't have super seniority for stewards or, or, or the local president. I mean, can you speak a little bit to that, Chris? Stewards. I think we do, have, we do have super seniority for stewards. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. We do. Uh, but let, let me throw this out here. I, I'm on a negotiating committee. I've been a steward. If that's what you're doing this job for, you don't need to do this job because it is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you, if there was a layoff and it got to me on the seniority list, I don't think I could live with myself that I would stay and let somebody with higher seniority be laid off and I stay. I would not be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of my brothers and sisters that's on these committees would be feel the same way, even right. though it would hurt. You know, like I said, harvest is plenty of labor is a few. We don't have many people working within the union. We need to have everybody in there. Somebody else will step up. But to me, getting laid off out of seniority, that, that's not what we're about.
Mm -hmm. I struggle with that. Right, right. But here again, you know, because your priorities are are uh, uh, given by, you know, that's not something that the union has to bargain for. If if the members, if the members are really against having super seniority, guess what? They can vote for a contract right. that doesn't have that. They can vote for a negotiating team Absolutely. that knows that that's not a priority of the membership, and and that's again because they want to they they the the, the bosses want to make you believe that the union is a third party that the union is different from the workers, and, that and that's they have not this, true. Like set formula that right. that they apply to every kind of industry, every kind of workplace, and that's just so not true. Yeah, I mean this video is is being shown to Hershey's workers, and it's not even. Like, it's not even a special video for Hershey's workers. It's literally a Labor Relations Institute stock video that's not, you know, they, you, you, you'll you notice that they don't mention Hershey and they don't mention BCTGM because it's a generic union video. They don't even have, that. they didn't even pay for the premium package to get their own video made. I mean, this is just like <laughs> bottom of the barrel stock stuff here. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I saw this probably about 25 years ago, uh, or something. Well, something they actually like had real yeah. people. It wasn't animated. Yeah, and and we've we've uh, shown some clips. Was it from Lowe's or Home Depot one uh, that was similar to this? And you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned though that you saw it that long ago because I think if you look at some of the media coverage of of the more recent union fights and especially some of the egregious stuff that Amazon is doing, you would kind of walk away thinking, oh, man, th th where did this come from? Mm -hmm. But as long as there have been unions, there has been union busting by the company. And, you know, these kinds of videos are not brand new. These did not just come out in the last year or two. They've been doing this stuff yeah. uh, as long as people have been trying to organize. And they've been doing a lot worse, too, than showing you videos. Right, frankly. right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Time off work for union business. In states without a right to work law, the union will demand that it can require the company to fire any worker who fails to pay dues or a similar fee. Now we get to the nitty gritty. The I'm sorry to, to pause it again, but I do want to make sure that folks understand, especially those of you who maybe don't belong to a union, uh, what we're what they're talking about here is an agency fee, and agency fee is not a dues payment. You are basically re reimbursing the cost to the union that is provided uh, in terms of the services you get. Right. In other words, you're not you don't have to belong to the union, but you still work under the contract that they spent their money and resources to negotiate mm -hmm. for you and your uh, other employees, uh, and you know. They may also have to provide some degree of representation for you if you are being fired, if you are being suspended, uh, whether you're a member or not, depending right. on, you know, it, of course, all this stuff varies by workplace and industry and union. But, uh, you know, of course, agency fees have already been banned for the public sector uh, mm -hmm. with the Janus Supreme Court. So uh, teachers and firefighters, other public sector employees, it doesn't even apply to them anymore. But frankly, it was never as bad of a thing as they've made it out to be. Right. Because if you're paying, I mean, if the union is paying, spending their dues dollars to negotiate a contract and to provide representation to employees, and you get to benefit from that without mm -hmm. even being a member, you trying to take a free ride here, um, that's not a, an unreasonable ask that you right. have to pay a, a, a smaller fee than the dues amount to, to try to reimburse for the cost. And you'll notice that they said the union will ask that. That doesn't mean, one, that doesn't mean the employer has to, you know, the state isn't coming in here and saying that, you know, oh, you have to, the boss has to agree to an agency fee clause. And because the union is the workers, if the workers at a certain workplace feel really strongly that they don't want to require people to pay an agency fee, they don't have to. And that's democratic. Right. It's like, you know, yep. if the workers don't want to do that, then they don't have to. And if you, uh, you know, 
if you don't like paying an agency fee, there's a lot of non-union workplaces that you can go and work at. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it is, but, it's, it's, you it, try to encourage them to go. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> and and the thing is, it's just like the seniority and, and the other issues there. It all depends on what the workers themselves want. When it's mm-hmm. in a union environment, workers actually have input. And yeah. if the input's inadequate, they have the opportunity to organize to make that input uh, adequate. And I think that is such a key difference here because uh, non-union workplaces, nobody's asking for your opinion about seniority, mm-hmm. about who gets laid off, when. Uh, nobody's asking your opinion about any of this. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things we've heard a lot about uh, in terms of anti-union arguments, and I ran into someone the other day uh, at work. They said, yeah, you know, unions are cool. I like unions. They've done done a lot of good things. But the bad thing is, you know, everybody has to be equal and, you know, hard workers get paid the same as lazy workers. And, okay, again, you as the workers in a union have the opportunity to organize around whatever your priorities may be. And Mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you're in a situation where maybe there's a reason for you to have some kind of performance metrics or some kind of uh incentives whatever whatever is right for you and your colleagues right that's something you can buy that's for. what you can work for mm-hmm. so i mean it's just a mistake to generalize like that and assume well that's just the way it is with a union well no it's not it's the way it is with um non-union workplaces that you're not going to get any damn opinion at all well you can have opinions excuse me you can have an opinion doesn't it mean doesn't it's going to count for anything yeah negotiation process and we- yeah go ahead chris i'm sorry the leadership and the accountability part of it keep getting glossed over too right passed over as stewards and leaders we we can hold each other accountable hmm. because we're in this selected group right and we do have scabs that you know people that ain't paying dues that have the audacity and have no issue when something happened and they need a steward <laughs> have no issue oh, yeah. coming to the leadership <laughs> to come help them, mm-hmm. you know, and it ain't right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't want to get on that soapbox. No, I, but no, I'm glad you mentioned the <laughs> yeah. accountability part because again, even, even in a less than ideal union situation, there is a level of accountability there that you do not get for your management and you don't even get for your government, right. frankly. I mean, if you're a member of a local, you have more opportunity to vote out, you know, bad or mediocre leaders in your union than you'll ever have to vote out crappy school board members or city mm-hmm. council members. Uh, your vote's going to your vote's going to carry more, and you're going to have more of an opportunity to make a difference as opposed to whichever candidate gets the most donations. Yeah. Where these three lists get hashed out, the company and the union sit down at the bargaining table each with its list of proposals. As the two parties negotiate, the union will fight first and hardest for the items it must have to be successful as a union. Dues checkoff, union security if legal, super seniority, etc. The company will fight first and hardest for what it requires to be successful as a business, such as the flexibility to run the business efficiently and control costs, and a management rights clause to minimize union interference. What about the list of things the employees wanted? the things the union organizers promised they would deliver. The union will try to get some of these items too, but when push comes to shove, union negotiators have the exclusive authority to give these things up to get what the union needs. The most important thing to remember is that there are no guarantees in collective bargaining. There is no guarantee the parties will ever reach a contract. Employees could get more, they could get less or they could end up with the same deal they had before the union got in and have a new obligation to pay money to the union. And what about the things unions like to talk about when they need workers' support? I'm just gonna stop it there to say, if the workers end up with less, okay, obviously that's a problem for the union, but also the employer clearly Mm -hmm. asked for that, right? I mean, it's like they, (laughs) they, they kind of pretend they're not even part of this whole process. If wages go down in your next contract, well, I mean, the union, whose fault is that? Right. The, yeah. you, that wasn't the union's idea. Right. I mean, clearly the company pushed for that. Uh, so it's a really interesting way of like deflecting blame 
And, you know, they were mentioning, th- they talked about how, oh, the union is going to fight first and hardest for dues checkoff and, you know, maybe higher wages get left off. As if, like, just because it, you know, the, it takes two bullet points to say, do you know, one, dues checkoff, two, higher wages. As if because it takes up the same amount of space on paper that it requires the same, that it's even remotely equal. Like, dues checkoff is nothing. Like, that's, you know, a company will agree to that, and and, it, and it's not, there's no issue there. there. It doesn't cost them anything. It, it's just good um, administration. And if they're not, if they are giving you a hard time about that, then clearly they're just trying to screw with the union and, and yeah. hurt their membership intentionally. I mean, right. yeah. I'll be honest with y'all. This would be my fourth contract, and it is, it's not a... It's not a big an issue. Our dues are calculated, two hours of pay, you know, on average. It's not a big issue. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Things like dignity and respect. <laughs> Neither party is even required to discuss these, and you won't find either in union contracts. Unions want you to believe okay, that... Okay, hold on. Work- so you're not going to find... It is probably true that you're not going to find, quote, dignity and respect in a union contract. But, like, what that wouldn't even mean anything. Like, dignity and respect, Article 4, Section 5. Like, right, that's not di- really... That, that's not, <laughs> what we mean when we say we should have dignity and respect on the job is that we should have uh, policies that... In, that make the employers, that make the bosses, that make the managers treat us with dignity and respect, like job security, like a grievance procedure when a boss harasses us, like you know uh, appropriate time off when we need time off, like for sick leave and things like that. That's what dignity and respect means. It doesn't mean that I want the boss to sign on the dotted line like Jacob has dignity. Like screw right. that. I don't care. I don't. You know. That doesn't matter. I want the the things that dignity means. And notice they didn't. Again, they're they're kind of putting themselves uh, separate from this process. They're the employer. Should they wish to treat their employees with dignity and respect, by all means, they have every right to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, putting putting abstract values in contract language is not the same as actually doing it. Right. Workers have power that if the company doesn't agree to the union's demands, the union can call a strike. And that can happen. But if you strike for economic reasons, which is what collective bargaining is all about, you can be permanently replaced. Unions often threaten companies with strikes during negotiations. But in many cases, unions will also use the threat of a strike against its members to pressure them to accept a contract the members don't want. But why would a union pressure its members to make a bad contract? The truth is, the union is the only party that must get a contract to get paid. The company is in business and has the opportunity to make a profit. The workers have jobs and receive paychecks. But without a contract, the union gets nothing. So let's stop the there. Key question for workers. The, the, they're talking about strikes as it, again as if this big scary union boss from halfway across the country is going to come and tell you uh, that you have to strike. Oh, there are going to be risks when you take a strike, and that's why it's important. And and like Chris, you know, I'm sure that when y'all have your strike meetings, there are discussions about the pros and cons, and people are weighing the the risks of going on strike. Right? That's not a decision that that your union or that any union would make lightly. Right? Our next union meeting, March 26, and that's a week before we leave to go negotiate. That's going to be a, a hopefully a wrap. If those when the survey discussions will come into place, the communications on where we are on our proposals, there'll be many discussions between now and that vote. So everybody can make the, a good decision. And once again, the negotiating committee, the five guys, we will have a recommendation. And, and, it's, and it's not, you know, it's not going to be easy. I, I, I don't take it lightly that if I got to come back and tell a group of people that I work with, friends of mine, we need to go on strike because I know how it affects their family. Mm-hmm. But it, it, 
it's not our business rep or the president of the IAM coming down and say, hey, y'all don't need to go or y'all need to go on strike. It's going to be the employees. We're mm-hmm. the union. We make that call. Right. And why is a strike effective? A strike is effective because y'all are the people that actually do the work. And so that can push a company to uh, to give you more of the things that you want. You know, you're it's going to hurt a little bit in the short term. And uh, but in a lot of cases, it can get you a really big benefit. And of course, because it's going to hurt in the short term, that's why you have those discussions. That's why you have those meetings. That's why there are going to be hard conversations about the pros and cons. And like, is this short term hurt? Is it worth what we think we can get? How much do we think that we can get from a strike? Those are all conversations that workers have amongst themselves before they make the decision to strike. And so, you know. Absolutely. What might the union give up in negotiations to make sure it gets paid? Collective bargaining is about three lists, two wish lists and a union's absolutely must have list. In the end, there are only three possible outcomes. You might get more, You might stay the same, or you might end up with less. And if the union gets what it wants, you will have to pay. Is that worth the roll of the dice? Don't gamble with your future, they say. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I would... It's very funny because this is something that they always say in every single anti no matter what the subject is almost if you hear a boss talking to you about how unions are bad they'll say you might get more you might get the same you might get less it would be i would pay good money if they showed me a single union contract that is worse than those employees had before they got it because there is never a standard contract because this this anti-union industry it is it's a billion dollar industry. There are hundreds of these law firms. Each of these each of these fancy lawyers making thousands of dollars uh, per day. If there was a single union contract that they could point to where it was unambiguous that the workers got less than they had before they unionized, they would be trotting it out every single time. And they don't have it because it's not. It doesn't exist. It's not real. It doesn't exist. And, I can and- see. Yeah, go ahead. We've took concessions. I'm sorry. We've took concessions on several contracts, but what we've gained, we we gain. And and if Mm -hmm. we don't look like we're gaining, we strike. Bottom line. And that's even, and, and that's, you know, you're taking concessions from your last union contract. You're not taking Absolutely. concessions from before you unionized. It's always been better than before it was organized or, or you know, that's taking concessions from one contract to another is a totally different thing. You know, maybe the, you know. Or at the hands of bankruptcy court. Or right? at the hands of bankruptcy you know, court, like our right. brothers but, and sisters in Brookwood where, you know, that played a role in, in the contract and the problems they have with their contract. But that's uh, totally different than right. saying, oh, you unionized and then you got a worse contract. They don't have that contract uh, because it doesn't exist. No. So uh, one, one time I heard a salary person, he was talking about health care insurance. And he said, he made a statement. It was around contract time. He said that if we wasn't organized, our insurance would be cheaper than theirs. And I asked him, how much he has cost right now. And what he had, which the, our salary people are not organized, was costing more than what I had. So I said, how does that make sense? And it, and it didn't make sense. Yeah. We are in a better position because we are organized labor. Simple as that. Yeah. Chris, thank you very much for your time tonight. I really yeah, appreciate absolutely. it. Do you have any, uh, do you have any, I- any closing thoughts as, uh, before we let you go? No, I, I appreciate the time. Again, like I said, my name is Chris Mullins. Anybody can contact contact me, and if they got questions on this, I do the best I can. And I appreciate the time you guys gave me today. Absolutely, Absolutely. yeah, I've enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. 
All right, yeah, we've been talking to Chris Mullins. Uh, we've been going through an anti-union video about collective bargaining with a member of a union bargaining committee. And, you, folks, you don't get more of a direct response than that. Uh, so we appreciate we appreciate his time, and, and we appreciate your time listening. Um, we're gonna take uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and then we're gonna come back with one more announcement uh, before we wrap up the show. You're listening to the Valley Labor Report. Energy Alabama supports consumers and is a leader in advocating for them. They have been able to successfully fight off utility rate increases in the state, reduce fees for electric vehicles, increase electric vehicle infrastructure spending, and they secured a $100 million refund by Alabama Power after the utility overcharged customers for fuel. To learn more about their work advocating for customers and to join the fight, go to energyalabama.org. There's a lot of talk about a shortage of workers, but that's not the case with IBW558. We have provided our customers over 3,000 workers and performed over 3 million man hours in a pandemic year. With 8,000 OJT hours, 900 classroom hours, OSHA 30, and a state license, our members receive the equivalent of a master's degree. That's what makes IBW558 the right choice for your electrical needs. Look us up at Facebook or at IBW558.org. The attorneys of Maples, Tucker, and Jacobs are proud to represent working people in Alabama and across the Southeast. They have over 100 years of experience representing injured workers in workers' compensation, personal injury, and disability claims. Let their attorneys help you when you get injured on the job. You can find them at www.mtandj.com or 855-617-9333. Let Maples, Tucker, and Jacobs help you when you get injured on the job. Again, the website is www.mtandj.com or the phone number 855-617-9333. No representation is made that the quality of legal services is greater than the quality of legal services from other law firms. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans. And we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers. And we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know we can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE. Dot O-R-G. Paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. North Alabama DSA is looking for folks to work for a better North Alabama. They prioritize mutual aid, municipal activism, and union solidarity. Contact them on social media or DSA North Alabama at Gmail for more information. radio show you're listening to the valley labor report my name is jacob morrison or as they are calling me in the youtube comment section now dollar tree patrick bateman uh and my co-host is adam keller if you want to weigh in on anything we've been talking about feel free you can give us a call 844-899-TVLR the phone number is 844-899-8857 this is a pre-tape so you're not going to be able to join us live but you can leave Leave us a voicemail and we will answer it on the next show. Just a reminder that you can always go back and listen to the full show and any individual clips like our conversation going over an anti-union collective bargaining info thing from an anti-union union busting firm on our YouTube channel. 
the Valley Labor Report. We've got all sorts. We've got 555 videos on our YouTube channel. All very good stuff. Lots of good interviews, lots of good educational segments, debunking anti-union propaganda. Lots of good stuff. Lots of good stuff. Uh, so we're... Um, and I'm going to take this chance to plug some of the Amazon coverage from this time last year or so. Uh, you and David did a great job interviewing folks from the Amazon warehouse and folks involved in the Amazon campaign. So uh, as uh, workers there finish up this vote, check out check out some of those clips. Check yep. them out from a year ago. See how the whole thing started. Exactly, exactly. So um, we've not got a lot of time left here on the radio, so we're just going to plug one more thing, and then we're going to go ahead and get out of here, and that is uh, Lee Baines the Third and the Glory Fires. Many people are saying they are the best band to ever come out of Alabama. Uh, Lee was instrumental in pulling together that fundraiser that we did last year for the striking miners. Uh, he put in so many hours of of preparation not to mention doing the show for free you know that's like how he makes his money at least part of it he, you know he, he works in the construction industry um outside of that but uh you know he's a hell of a guy his music is great and we could not have raised seventy five thousand dollars for their strike fund last year without him and he's got a new record that is coming out in August that you can finally pre-order. Pre-orders are up now. They announced it with a profile in the Rolling Stone. So y'all had better go and read that article in the Rolling Stone. Um, the, ti the title of the article is uh, something like, Lee Baines would like it if you sang along with this one. Um, it's really great. I love the article. It was really good insight into, um, you know, into the making of this album and into how he makes his music. Um, and then go and pre-order his album. It's going to be great. Um, and while you wait for the full album to come out, you can listen to the single that he dropped, God's Away working man now uh you know i'm definitely a fan of their heavier and punky type stuff but as you could tell from our selection of intro music i also love a good sing-along song i grew up um in an evangelical church where we really prioritized singing of hymns and gospel music and as uh you know as i have uh, as i grew out of my you know younger rebellious teen phase I, I came back to my love of southern gospel and so i'm i'm just as likely to listen to southern gospel songs as i am anything else now i love it uh, and i love being able to sing along with it and uh, they're saying that several of the songs on this record seek to ju do just that um and the process got started in lee's mind about having songs that are easy to sing along to because a student asked him after a show if he ever wrote songs for the pur for that purpose for the purpose of a crowd singing along to a song asking that because that's what so many people in the labor movement in the last century did they've had they'd have like a whole union hall singing along with a song as an act of solidarity, there'd be singing on the picket lines. And we've actually seen, seen like a minor resurgence of this in some of the teacher strikes and things like this. Um, if sorry. you've never sang Solidarity Forever with a large crowd of people, you should uh, do you're it. missing out. And yeah. no matter how terribly you might sing, uh, it is so much fun. It, it is a lot of fun. Uh, from the article, Lee says, it really stuck with me, the notion of a sing-along. I tend to associate that with commercialism, give them something they can spit back at you in a beer commercial. But the way he framed it is that it's also solidarity. And I thought that was really cool. So I'm incredibly excited. The album is called Old Time Folks. His record label is Don Giovanni Records. So go buy it. Enjoy the single. Read the profile in the Rolling Stone. And uh, we're going to get Lee on the show sometime to talk about it. But I wanted to make that announcement before we wrapped here on the radio. Um, as we're wrapping up, let's do a couple of plugs. You can, like I said, you can leave us a voicemail at 844-899-TV. LR that is 844-899-8857. We've got a new hat. We placed the order yesterday on Friday, but we ordered some extra so you can still get yours. And of course, you can uh, send us a monthly donation. You can navigate there from our website tvlr.fm. Folks, that is it for us on the radio. If you find us online, you can stay tuned for overtime. We are answering your phone calls, uh, answering voicemails. We're talking about Starbucks workers hitting back and more, so you don't want to miss it. All power to the workers. 
All right, so we got rid of those folks on the radio. Howdy, uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for staying with us. We've got a great overtime lined up for you. You can uh, uh, you can still leave us a voicemail, 844-899-8857. We're going to take a short break, and we will be right back. Support for the Valley Labor Report comes from the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers Union. Learn more by visiting www.ifpte.org. The attorneys of Maples, Tucker, and Jacobs are proud to represent working people in Alabama and across the Southeast. They have over 100 years of experience representing injured workers in workers' compensation, personal injury, and disability claims. Let their attorneys help you when you get injured on the job. You can find them at www.mtandj.com or 855 617 9333. Let Maples, Tucker, and Jacobs help you when you get injured on the job. Again, the website is www.mtandj.com or the phone number 855 617 9333. No representation is made that the quality of legal services is greater than the quality of legal services from other law firms. Support for this program comes from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 136, out of Central Alabama. Learn more at IBEW136.org. Come all you poor workers, good news to you, I'll tell how the good old union has come in here to dwell. A battle in the heart of Alabama caught our attention. Coal miners in one community, they've been on strike now for months. Working as long as 12 hours a day, seven days a week, in some of the most dangerous conditions. I really think that the labor movement is the single greatest force for democracy in the history of the United States. The story of Alabama is a story of not just resilience, but of militancy. I say no contract, you say no If we ain't all free, ain't none of us free. You're listening to Alabama's only union talk radio show, The Valley Labor Report, with Adam Keller and Jacob Morrison. Welcome back, Tennessee Valley. You are still listening to The Valley Labor Report, Alabama's only union talk radio show. We are now in overtime, and we've got some good stuff. We're answering your voicemails about Elon Musk, talking about Starbucks workers hitting back at the company after severe retaliation, and, of course, we are getting to last week in Southern Labor. So let's get started. Um, so we're going to start off with Last Week in Southern Labor. This is a segment that we like to do every week where we talk about what happened in the last week in the labor movement in the South. We pull this from Jonah Furman's newsletter, Who Gets the Bird? You can read it at whogetsthebird.substack.com. He compiles everything that happens as it pertains to working people in the United States every week. I mean, the amount of things that he's able to compile every week is astounding, and a lot of stuff that's not even, like, federal... You know, a lot of it he pulls from uh, NLRB filings for elections and things like that. But a lot of stuff, he just finds, like, local news articles about, you know, uh, a, lo- a sick out or something like that. You know, yeah. a sick out of 47 school br- school bus drivers, that's not reported federally. He just finds it. And so the amount of stuff that he's able to find is really amazing. It's really great. I really recommend uh, subscribing to his newsletter, who gets the bird.substack.com, to find out what happens in U.S. labor every week. But for what happens in Southern labor, you can stay tuned. We'll get right to it in new organizing. Four tree trimmers in Asplund are organizing in Paintsville, Kentucky with IBEW Local 369. 80 workers who make rockets for Aerojet Rocket Dine in Huntsville, Alabama are organizing with the machinists. I talked to David earlier this week when I was preparing. I was like, hey, you didn't tell me about this. 
what's going on here? And so he told me a little bit about it. Uh, so that's pretty that's cool. exciting. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, looking forward to supporting those workers however we can. 28 RNs for Atlantis Healthcare in Mayagas, uh, Puerto Rico are unionizing with 1199 SEIU. 10 sanitation workers for Euro Caribe Packing in Vega Baja, Puerto Rico are organizing with the Teamsters Local 901. 40 more workers for wine distributor Wine are organizing in Glen Allen, Virginia, but with the quote-unquote liquor and wine sales representatives Local 3, which she puts in quotes because it's a Chicago-based union of dubious integrity run by a politically influential family that in 1999 was found to be replacing its own members' jobs through a staffing agency and in at least one NLRB case from 2001 was found to have been brought in specifically to supplant the, the Teamsters, which could be what's happening here, considering that just last month UFCW filed for an election at Winebow in upstate New York, and last year the Teamsters did the same thing in California. So company unions are a real thing, and you got to watch out for them, folks. In election wins, after filing for an election at the NLRB, the staff at the Charlotte Observer won voluntary recognition with the Washington Baltimore News Guild. That's a very cool thing. In strike and bargaining updates, 17,000 Texas Kroger workers are back on strike notice with UFCW Local 455 as the company continues to refuse to sign the tentative agreement that they already agreed to back in December in which the union sent to the members for ratification. They just literally won't sign the contract. After they agreed to sign it, making it official. So that's crazy. Um, this is based on issues outside of the contract, like the union's insistence that the company pay back dues after unilaterally stopping paycheck dedu- deductions for over a year. Oh. But it is, uh, we're pretty sure, Jonah is pretty sure that uh, that is an illegal thing to do to hold the contract and attendant raises, et cetera, hostage because of a non contractual dispute with the union. Seems like that's illegal. But Kroger is doing it anyway. Um, 49 school bus drivers in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, organized a sick out this week, hoping to win similar gains to their neighbors in St. Tammany Parish, who won $4,100 in extra pay. The months-long MLB-MLBPA lockout continues, but it's really intensified in the past week as, like we said last week, opening day has officially been postponed. The first time a lockout has affected... This is the first time a lockout has affected the regular MLB season, so that's pretty wild. UE Local 150 municipal workers in Charlotte and Greensboro, North Carolina, rallied for fair pay. Transit workers with ATU Local 1593 in Hillsboro, Kentucky, Florida, Hillsboro County, Florida, apologies, have rejected a last, best, and final officer offer from the Hart Transit Authority and are launching a campaign, WTF. Where's the fairness to take their fight to the board and the public? And finally, in political fights, the Kentucky Teachers Retirement System sold off its investment in Russia's Spearbank the day before the Russian invasion, losing $3 million on its initial $15 million investment. That is tough. That is tough. Uh, so next up, there have been some there have been some uh, uh, some new stats that have come out about Alabama recently that Adam has been seeing uh, ha- has seen flying around, and so he compiled all of them in a, uh, uh, for us. So Adam, go ahead and take it away. Talk to us about uh, what's going on in the Yellowhammer State. Sure thing. And uh, before we move on, uh, I know this is not really Southern labor, but worth mentioning that our brothers and sisters in Minneapolis public schools have gone on strike as of Tuesday, March 8th. So by the time this episode airs, we will see if there's a victory. Uh, We hope so. All power to the teachers and support staff up there in Minneapolis. So wanted to talk about Sweet Home Alabama. In the last few months, we've seen some really interesting studies released about the quality of life for working people here in the state. 
Back in December, the Public Affairs Research Council of Alabama, or PARCA, released a report on state tax collections across the country. Their findings? Alabama had the country's second lowest tax collections per capita in 2019. Only Tennessee collected less state and local tax revenue per resident than Alabama. Alabama has the lowest per capita property tax collections in the country, and our state's income tax is essentially flat, with the top rate of 5% applied to an individual's taxable income over only $3,000. Meanwhile, Alabama has among the highest sales tax rates in the U.S. So, Alabama combines low tax rates with a less valuable base of economic activity, yielding less in taxes per capita and less revenue for state and local government to actually provide services to the public, i.e. the reason they're supposed to exist. Um, And the taxes that they do collect here in this state tend to be regressive, meaning they disproportionately affect working class people while low income and while uh, income and property taxes disproportionately benefit the wealthy. Sales taxes hurt folks a lot more uh, the less money you have. Those grocery taxes that you pay at Walmart and Publix and Kroger, yeah, the wealthy aren't too worried about that. Right. But the rest of us, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, because I mean, working people spend their whole income basically, or or a lot right. of their income surviving. So it's just it, it's it's intuitive that sales taxes hurt working people more because it you know there's a there's a there's a flat kind of expenditure that you have to do to live and and let's put that at I don't know twenty five thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars a year. Well, if you make thirty five thousand dollars a year. You're spending all of that on right. goods and services, and on that is being applied a eight nine percent sales tax. Whereas, if somebody makes three hundred thousand dollars, you know, th- they're only spending so much money, and that amount of money is being taxed at the same rate as when you buy a thing. But they've got a lot more income to absorb that tax. And that's why we say that sales tax is regressive um, and income taxes, are even even where income taxes are flat, they're not regressive because it's proportional. You know, right. if you make $30,000 or you make, you know, $10,000 in a year and you pay a 5% income tax, that's going to hit you, you know, because you make so much less money, it's not quite the same, but... If there's at least a proportionality with a flat tax. Really, we should be looking at a progressive tax where the more you make, the more society has benefited you, uh, the more you have to pay back to society to help fe- people who are less fortunate, um, who, who don't have the same income as you. But that's sales taxes, getting so much of our money from sales tax and still taxing groceries, right. mind you, yeah. that's crazy. One of the only states in the country to fully tax groceries. Um, and of course, whenever Alabama is definitely Desperate for revenue, they love to go to uh, user fees and licensing fees and sin taxes, quote unquote, on alcohol and tobacco. Um, you know, we saw a recent gas tax increase uh, with this current legislature, which obviously right about now is, is stinging a little bit for most of us. So Alabama has that really uh psh- deadly combination of mm-hmm. being both inadequate to actually do what we need to do as a state, uh, but also regressive in punishing you the l- less money you have. Yeah. Uh, so if you check the show notes, you'll see a write-up from Alabama Political Reporter. Back a couple months ago, you can find a link to that full report from Parka. And last month in February, there was new data from the National Center for Health Statistics, which was released, indicating that of the 50 states and the District of Columbia, Alabama ranks 49 of 51 overall in life expectancy. This data is also from 2019. The national average for life expectancy in the U.S. was 78.8 years, while the Alabama average was 75.2 years. In other words, living in Alabama costs three and a half years off our average life expectancy compared to the national average. And no surprises here, but the report showed a strong correlation between a state's poverty rate and their life expectancy. And, of course, Alabama has more poverty than the national average. 
Also in February, our friends at Alabama Rise commissioned a survey of likely Alabama voters with the research firm Signal to find out how people felt about Medicaid expansion. The results? Well, roughly 7 in 10 Alabamians, including nearly two-thirds of Republicans, support expanding Medicaid when told about the arguments in favor of expansion. There was similar support in the survey respondents for using American Rescue Plan, or ARPA funds towards Medicaid expansion. This comes on the heels of another report from PARCA, which shows Medicaid expansion could save the state nearly $400 million a year while creating over 20,000 jobs per year and producing an overall economic impact of $1.8 billion per year. The report also found that the annual savings would be higher than the annual cost of the expansion. Worth remembering when legislators and governors blame lack of a financial plan or budget implications as to why they can't expand Medicaid. Right. As a reminder, we've seen eight rural hospitals in Alabama close from 2011 to 2020, and Alabama is one of only 12 states to not yet expand Medicaid. Expanding Medicaid would cover nearly 300,000 Alabamians, which would, of course, be a huge boost to quality of life and would literally save lives. And yeah. as a reminder, there are people that are caught in the coverage gap, in the Medicaid gap, where you make too much money to qualify for Medicaid as it exists, uh, but not enough money to get significant subsidies through the ACA uh, or to be able to really afford decent health insurance. So that's about 300,000 of our neighbors who would immediately benefit and be able to go to the doctor to get preventative care, to get life-saving care, and maybe, just maybe, our life expectancy wouldn't be three and a half years shorter than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the arguments against Medicaid expansion are just nonsensical. They, they don't have them, really. They don't I mean, have any. They always point to the budget. But these people, they're supposed to be... They're supposed to be business people, right? And business people should know that you have to spend that that you can spend money to make money, right? right? Like if 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 a company like Amazon, for instance, used the same logic as our legislators in Montgomery do to refuse expanding Medicaid. If Amazon operated by the same logic, then they would not be building a uh, 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 distribution centers across the country because right. it costs money. Right. It costs money to build those distribution centers, even though Amazon gets crazy tax breaks and, and governments right. so, fund yeah, a in lot that of case, it. Hell, but, maybe it doesn't cost a lot of money. But, but it costs some right. money, at right. least. It costs some amount of money. But Sometimes they do it anyway. Invest. Yeah, they do it anyway. Why do they do it anyway? Because it's going to make them more money than it costs, as is obvious in the case of Medicaid expansion. It will obviously obviously bring in more money for the state of Alabama, create more revenue to have less people dying, okay? <laughs> I mean, on yeah. so many levels, but, but yeah. at the fundamental level, it's just that intuitive. We will have fewer people dying if we expand Medicaid, and on that basis alone, we will generate economic activity. Again, in a, in a state that is uh, known to celebrate family values and where every politician brags about their religious faith on TV, I mean, I would think saving lives would be a pretty big priority. And You would think. As you mentioned about the opposition to it, uh, if you actually go back and check when this poll – when the polling data was released, there were some statements from various Alabama officials in the legislature and elsewhere, and they really didn't have much of an answer beyond, um, I believe one quote I saw was, there's not much appetite for this in our mm. caucus. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I also saw, you know, more comments along the lines that you mentioned of making sure that there's the long-term viability of the program financially. Again, we now have a plethora of research to show that it would pay for itself. But even if you are concerned about that, you want to be on the conservative side, Alabama Rise has put out a, a plan. They've discussed it here on this show uh, to where you could actually remove the federal income tax deduction, the FIT. You could remove that from Alabama's tax code, remove the grocery sales tax 
right? So you're you're increasing taxes on one end, you're removing taxes on the other end. It would generate enough extra revenue to replace the sales tax on groceries, pay for the upfront initial cost of Medicaid expansion while providing extra funding in case there are overruns in the future. And oh, by the way, you would have extra money left over to invest in people. <laughs> um, and the majority of Alabamians would actually see a tax cut, right? The majority, the only people who would end up paying a little bit more would be the very wealthiest who are paying larger income taxes at the federal level. So naturally, that's why it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Um, so check out CoverAlabama.org for more information about this polling data, about more of the research behind Medicaid expansion, why it should happen, why we need it to happen, and how you can help with that. But all this to say that uh, we have an a- inadequate system of taxes that favors the wealthy while punishing the working class, both in its regressive sales taxes and the lack of government services. We have a quality of life that is so bad in this state that our people live shorter lives. And we have an example of a policy here that could help both the quality of life and the economy that is broadly popular with the people of Alabama. So what is the Alabama legislature doing? Arguing over how to restrict your right to protest, seeking to discriminate against transgender kids and their families, and all sorts of ways to participate in the cultural war spectacle while preserving a status quo that is completely broken for working class people. You know, two of the most significant union battles in the country are happening right here in this state with the union drive at Bessemer's Amazon Warehouse and the nearly year-long strike by coal miners in Brookwood. Meanwhile, our politicians remain silent about these struggles. Are they just straight up tout the company line, even though getting more Alabamians and unions would address all of these major issues detailed in these recent reports? Alabama is at the top of everything bad and at the bottom of everything good. We deserve better, and a better Alabama is possible, but only if we come together, build a diverse movement, and organize our workplaces and communities to fight for the better Alabama that isn't just possible, but necessary. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, So... Just a reminder, we have a phone number, and when we are not live, you can leave us a voicemail. The phone number is, again, 844-899-TVLR. That is 844-899-8857. Adam, let's go ahead and play that voicemail that we got last week. Adam and uh, Jacob, this is Joe Marshall Indicator. Musk invites auto union to hold organizing vote at the factory. That's Elon Musk and his Tesla plant. Out in California, supposedly employs 10,000 people. Uh, uh, Musk's Twitter said Tesla would do nothing to stop them. The UAW wouldn't comment, but spokesman Brian Rothensburg pointed out that Tesla's fighting the U.S. National Labor Relations Board ruling from last year that found the company and Musk engaged in unfair labor practices in 2018. I just thought I'd give you that little bit of information. Maybe I won't look into it in the future. Talk to you later. Bye now. Yep. Thanks for calling in, Joe. Uh, I was wanting to talk about that anyway, so now I've got a good excuse to. I appreciate it. Uh, He did also mention in his phone call about Delphi's retirement. Uh, There there is legislation, and and I cut that part out because I, I don't, I don't know as much about it, but but I did want to just just mention it that that he mentioned that there is um, there is some there is legislation that's going through the U.S. Senate right now to pay for the retirement of salaried Delphi workers in the United States who lost their pension or 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 their four hundred one k or something because of a bankruptcy, and he mentioned how. Um, these were not union workers at Delphi. Uh, the union workers at Delphi were able to retain their pension, actually. Uh, it was the non-union workers at Delphi, and now the taxpayers are having to kind of bail them out. And so that's wow. kind of an interesting, you know, I, I, I want them to get their pensions, but that is an interesting, um, you know, interesting bit there. Um, so Elon Musk did tweet an invitation to the United Auto Workers to organize his plant. 
He did this while he was throwing a temper tantrum on Twitter about Biden not mentioning Tesla in one of his speeches, which, I mean, frankly, cry more about it. That's how I feel. Uh, In his tweet, he said that Tesla will not interfere, but he will absolutely not sign a binding agreement to that effect. (laughs) He will not sign that. He'll tweet it. He'll tweet it. it. But he won't sign on it. Uh, And the insistence that he would not interfere is completely at odds with the actual record at Tesla plants. The NLRB has ruled multiple times in favor of workers alleging that they have been fired by Tesla for their union support. And this after multiple appeals by Tesla. The NLRB has ruled in favor of the workers there. That means that Tesla was found to have illegally fired multiple workers and had to offer them reinstatement and back pay. So, (laughs) but of course he's not addressing that. And of course, you know, it's just, it's totally, totally silly. His tweet is completely at odds with his actual record that we can see. We all have computers. We all have eyes. We can see his record And it's totally at odds with what his tweet says. Um, This isn't the first time that he's lied on Twitter when it comes to unions, though. He said that his plants offer better wages and working conditions, too, when compared to union plants, which is, again, (laughs) in the same way that it's amazing that he would say, I won't interfere in a union campaign when we know that you've done it before. It's absolutely astounding to claim that you have better wages and working conditions than union plants because like this is you can find this information right yeah this is not difficult information to find and so in this clip we're going to play a worker uh, uh, uh more perfect union did a series of videos about tesla a few months ago and in this clip a worker who was fired by tesla for his union support and who the nlrb ruled in favor of he is talking about working at tesla compared to his old union auto worker job adam let's play that but when i was at Numi, doing the same job i was doing there technically a auto worker building a car on the line we were making a lot more money, between 30 and 35 an hour. And at Tesla, we were getting $20 an hour on second shift. That's with the premium. The, the hours we had to work were just 12 hours every day. No questions asked, 12 hours, six days a week. I've seen guys that were so afraid of missing that they were throwing up in buckets because they were sick, but they, they didn't want to lose their job. With Tesla, you, didn't, you weren't sure if you were going to be there next week, next month. But when they had the turnover so, so fast, you know, you couldn't plan. And nothing. They're using them up and spitting them out. <laughs> I mean, th- he was talking about making ten to fifteen dollars an hour more. Ten to fifteen dollars an hour more at Numi. Which, what the hell even is that? I mean, that's not even like a big three automaker, right? I mean, as so of course, obviously, the big three automakers with their UAW contracts are going to be comparable to damn knew me i mean i don't even know what that is but he was making 10 to 15 dollars an hour more at knew me than he was making on premium time at tesla on the night shift he was making 30 to 35 dollars an hour at knew me and 20 dollars an hour at night at tesla so it kind of gets worse from there because knew me <laughs> is uh, a joint factory uh, partnership between gm and toyota they closed back in 2010, and Tesla more or less took over the physical property and the plant and repurposed mm. it. So my my guess would be this guy is literally working at the same location. Uh, wow. It's now a new company. It's under Tesla. It's doing a little bit different work. But, yeah, I mean, he sounds like he was probably driving to literally the same property that wow. he'd done for years, and now he's taking a massive pay cut. As if low wages, long hours, and being so scared to miss a shift that you literally come into work puking, as if that wasn't bad enough, there are other extreme issues with worker safety at Tesla. Let's play that next clip. In 2015 alone, the rate of serious injury at Tesla's Fremont factory was 102% above the industry average. 
And in 2016, it was above the average by 82.5%. Tesla claims its 2019 injury rate dropped below the industry average. But the Center for Investigative Reporting found that Tesla underreported its injuries that year. On top of that, California's inspection agency said it couldn't verify Tesla's claims about safety improvements. Basically, everybody would cut their arms and hands. Sometimes people would bleed off the line and have to run to the bathroom, so it would be a man down, a second person. I would have to stop the line, and once you stop it, if you stop the line there, management would come over, would start yelling at you, and they'd be like, why did the, he cut his hand? What is he doing? Oh, change him out with someone better. Almost like a modern day industrial sweatshop. I mean, that's insane. Absol I don't see uh, Musk tweeting about that. Yeah. And if that wasn't bad enough, non-white workers have to deal with rampant racism. Adam, let's play that last clip. When I was working at Tesla, I experienced on the line being called the N-word. Different people call me the N-word. Not just workers, there are actually managers or supervisors and stuff like that on the line. Where I come from, you know, you just don't do that at work. It's not a place to be called that. When you've got over 100 people who have said they've been called the N-word at the Tesla factory in Fremont, that's pretty overwhelming evidence that there's a problem there. That's amazing. Over 100 people at one plant? That's it. That's... Like, what in the world is going on there? Like, I don't, when I heard the when I so so I really recommend y'all go back and watch these videos from More Perfect Union. You can find uh, More Perfect Union on YouTube anywhere you find us. You can find them, um, and they did all these videos a uh, few months like between five and eight months ago. And when I first saw the you know I, the the video starts and he's like, yeah, I was called the N word. I'm like, hmm. I mean, were you really, I mean, that's pretty crazy in like 2020, 2021, like that's pretty, that's a pretty big claim there. And then they go into talking about, they've got a hundred affidavits from a hundred different workers talking about, I was called the N word. Like what is going on? That's insane. That's crazy. And all this on top of the lower wages, the longer hours, the unsafe working conditions. I mean, this is just, this is insane. Yeah, I, I think it starts at the top. I mean, you look at Elon Musk and the way he conducts himself and the way he acts, the way he lies. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, like many billionaires and spoiled rich boys, I think he's got a God com complex. Um, you know, I guess he thinks he's going to be Iron Man or something. Yeah, I'm, um, I mean, you know, speaking of uh, speaking about a Elon personally, the worker in that video said that he emailed Elon personally. Like, apparently, all the workers there are given Elon's email address. And um, <clears throat> subsequent to that, Elon did not respond to him directly, but he sent out a company wide email telling people, quote, not to be jerks, to quote less represented groups, unquote. But he stressed that workers need to be thick skinned. This was basically a response to workers telling him that they were being called the N-word today. I mean, he didn't even have the, the decency to send an email saying, like, hey, we're, we're against racism. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we condemn that. We will not allow people to act that way at work. We're going to... Really? I mean, it, he could have just BS in the email, which, I mean, seriously. obviously he did anyway, but... Um, I think that shows a level of arrogance and bigotry, this, frankly. This worker never missed a day. He even got awards for his performance at Tesla. He was such a good worker, he got awarded for it wow. by Tesla. And then he was fired, subsequent to raising these complaints, for having a, quote, bad attitude. Not for being late. Not for performance issues because he had a bad attitude. That's why they say that they fired him. Um, and then, if you are fired at Tesla, they you are shuttled, as an employee at Tesla, you are shuttled to the plant um, from somewhere off plant. If you are fired, you can't take the shuttle back. And so they made him walk after being fired for having a, quote, bad, bad attitude to wherever he needed to go. They, they wouldn't let him use the shuttle. I mean, this is just insane. That's despicable. 
absolutely. And, and yeah, I can't help but wonder how many people, um, how many minorities working there are dealing with bigotry in the workplace, but now are too scared to say anything. Yeah, he said that he brought it up in a, like, in front of other co-workers. I think it was like in a meeting or something, and talked about how, like, I would rather not be called the N-word. And he said that they laughed at him. Like, what in... I mean, this is just... This is bizarre. And see, this this is part of why unioniz- unionization in the workplace is so connected to mm-hmm. ending discrimination mm-hmm. and to fighting racism and sexism and all forms of bigotry because with a union, you have more protection to actually... Uh, stand up for yourself, right? And you because have the it, ability to fight collectively to address these kind of issues. If you don't have a union, you can be fired for having a bad attitude, right? You can be fired for now, having a bad attitude. Legally, they're not supposed to fire you for reporting discrimination. That's a violation of Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act. Right. But good luck proving that, right? On your own, without a union to have your back, and almost certainly in front of some reactionary pro- pro-employer judge. To a understaffed federal agency that, you know, unless he has it on tape, yeah, unless they put it in writing, I, it's going to be hard for him to get a positive ruling from the EEOC. It's just, it's really despicable. I mean, and I'm, I'm having flashbacks to some conversations I've had with uh, workers over the years and, you know, that I represented mm-hmm. who, you know, particularly black women who were dealing with bigotry on the job. And yes, when they said something... That was the, the response was that they had a bad attitude right in so many words that's kind of you know they were they were a problem mm-hmm. you know they were difficult to work with well no they just don't like racism yeah <laughs> imagine that they shouldn't <laughs> I mean and no one should ever have to put up with that in the workplace or, or anywhere really but certainly not at work uh, and, and it's just it's despicable and I think that speaks a lot to uh, the kind of culture that's been cultivated in this company. Yeah. So if ever there was a company that needed a union, uh, this is definitely one of them. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's just, yeah. Elon Musk is a liar. He's an exploiter. He's a capitalist. He does not care about his workers. He doesn't care a about society. South African He's, from a diamond mining yeah. family. So, um, right. Emerald mining. Emerald uh, mining. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Not diamonds. Emeralds. Kind of wonder yeah. what kind of blood has. Uh, Fertilized this family tree. Insane. Absolutely insane. Um, in other workplace retaliation against organizing worker news, uh, Starbucks. Starbucks is continuing its retaliation against organizing employees, this time by cutting hours for employees nationwide after firing a pro-union employee in Buffalo for not being available enough. As you will recall, um, I, it's just the, not even bothering to be consistent, not not even trying at this point. Um, and now they have fired a second pro-union employee in Buffalo for being late. This employee was late because their shift was moved without warning to openings, despite the fact that they have a second job working nights at Trader Joe's, giving them almost no time to sleep. The morning that they were fired, they slept in their car in the Starbucks parking lot after finishing their shift at Trader Joe's at midnight, and they went to the Starbucks parking lot and slept before they opened and when they but to ensure that they were not late again, right? Like the previous shift or something like that, they were late. They were twenty minutes late. Yeah, yeah they because, had car trouble. Yeah, they had car trouble. It was like twenty to thirty minutes late. I mean, it's not life ending. Uh, it's not you know twenty thirty minutes because you had car trouble. Not a big deal. It happens. It happens it, to us all, especially if you're uh, relying on wages from Starbucks. Yeah. Uh. So the morning that they were fired, they slept in their car in the Starbucks parking lot to ensure that they were not late again. When they walked in, they were fired. Starbucks workers have shot back against this, against cutting the hours nationwide. Which, I mean, look, if you're going to cut hours for workers, you have to accept that you're a part-time job. You're a part-time employer, and your employees are going to have second 
and sometimes third jobs, and you have to accommodate that. Yeah, they want full-time availability for part-time work. It's it's absurd. And, and, and there's too many of these stupid chain places like this that do this, where they expect full-time availability yeah. for part-time work. Yeah. Yep. And that is, that's ridiculous. Starbucks workers have shot back by launching an enormous Twitter blitz with the hashtag Why We Organize, where Starbucks workers have listed a myriad of grievances from especially the biggest one is cutting the hours while they raise prices alongside record profits. Okay, so they've got record profits, then they're raising prices, and now they're trying to cut their labor costs. I mean, it's it's absurd. Having to work immediately following the death of a loved one when I was going through this hashtag, that happened like multiple times. It's it's like, you, you know, there, there's that, that thing on TikTok where, uh, you know, this cartoon character says, I, you know, if I had a nickel for every time this happened, I would have two nickels, which isn't a lot of nickels, but that's a lot of times for that to happen. Like, you know, I mean... There was like half a, do- half a dozen of these stories of people like having to work immediately following the death of, of like a, a mother or a husband or something. I'm like, my God, like, you know, six, six times. That's like, that's right. not a lot of nickels, but that's, that's a lot of, to- of, of workers. Yeah, and we're talking I mean, about lattes here. Yeah, seriously. This isn't, this isn't um, you know, like they're not, surgery. yeah. Right. I mean, good grief. And, and I'm not trying to say that to downplay the, the, you know, the workers and the work that they do, but I, I mean, my point being, there's, there's no, no one's going to die. Yeah, there's no one's no going to die. There's no emergency right, right. that would justify such a callous move. Yeah. Um, being forced to work while sick, inconsistent and unfair discipline, and lots more. You, you, should, you should look at that hashtag, why we organize on Twitter. Uh, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of Starbucks workers are, um, are, are tweeting with this hashtag about the conditions that they're facing at Starbucks that are forcing them to organize. You know, every time, uh, I think every worker should have a union. Every worker should have a union, even if you've got the best boss in the world, even if you've got great working conditions and, and wages and all this, if you have zero complaints, you should still have a union because that can change tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is that lots, most people who have good wages, who have good working conditions, who have a good relationship with their boss and with their management, they don't unionize. All of these campaigns are brought on by the boss, by and large. There's not, you know, the, the even though I wish that weren't the case, that is the case a lot of the time. It's that these organizing campaigns the bosses have nobody to blame but themselves and you can clearly see when you go through this hashtag on twitter that that is the case for starbucks amid all this workers continue to announce new unions they are now up to 129 uh workplaces announced where they will be filing for a union election and uh, by the time that you hear this we will probably have three more union Starbucks in Buffalo. The vote count in three more union elections in Buffalo are this week. Uh, remember, we're pre-taping this episode on Tuesday. So, um, so yeah, we will probably have more union Starbucks in the country by the time that you hear this um, amid nationwide retaliation. I mean, this isn't even just happening. The, the, the cutting back of hours isn't even just happening at union locations. It's like they're trying to punish everybody. Um, so it, it's it's really, and I don't know why they would think that that is going to harm the, you know, like right. That doesn't make sense any me. To, it doesn't make any sense to me as a tactic, but that goes to show you that uh, the bosses are not any better than you. They are humans, and sometimes humans do stupid things and cruel cool things, but also stupid things, and they don't think things through. So. Um, the last story that we wanted to talk about was, oh, no, 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 there's one more story. This is, this is just going to be a really quick one because I just got a text from Travis McCoy. He is a steward of the National Association of Letter Carriers, Branch 462 in Huntsville. He texted me while we were, uh, taping the show that the, um, the Postal Service Reform Act passed the Senate. 
This is huge news. That is huge, great. huge, huge news. The Postal Service Reform Act is a very important piece of legislation in protecting the Postal Service from privatization, in ensuring that it continues to provide working people with good jobs, and in ensuring it provides working people with good service, with on-time delivery, with six-day delivery. <clears throat> with uh, making sure, you know, protecting it from privatization. And, uh, I mean, this is such good news. And, and the reason that it's so important is, uh, I'll just just a, a really short overview. You can go back and, and watch our some, some previous coverage that we've done of this we've spoken to. Um, last year we spoke to Anna Mudd, the legislative director, I believe is her, her title for the National Association of Letter Carriers about this legislation. But the biggest thing that it does is it repeals the health care uh, pre-funding mandate for retirees, which was instituted on a bipartisan basis, which is all the more surprising for this passage because usually bipartisan means you're being screwed even harder. Um, but in 2006, it was passed on a bipartisan basis to mandate that the Postal Service pre-fund health care for retirees 75 years in advance. 75 years in advance. No other federal agency does that. No other private company does that. But the Postal Service was required to do that in 2006. And why is that? Because Democrats and Republicans want to privatize it. And so there's been enough pushback on that from the workers at the Postal Service and from the people who receive that service that there is finally support in Congress to repeal that, which is really, really good. Because every time, every time that you hear all this nonsense about, oh, the Postal Service every year it operates on such a big deficit. Every year it goes into debt. Every year it doesn't. You know, for one thing, I don't care if it runs like government services are not to make a profit. That's not why we do these things. We do these things to provide a public good to our citizens. We don't do it. That's why it's that's why it's run by the government. If we wanted it run for if we wanted it to make a profit for a few people, it would be a private enterprise, which it's not. It, it, it's public because we want to do a, uh, we want to provide the public with this service. Okay, so even if it a service did, dating back to literally the founding of the country. Yeah, so even if it did run a deficit every year, that's not reason enough to attack the postal service. Um, but it doesn't. Every time that you hear about the postal service running this huge debt deficit, whatever. Like 90 something percent of that can be attributed to the healthcare prefunding mandate. 90 something percent of that. It's bogus, totally unnecessary, does not help the Postal Service perform, does not help the taxpayer, does not help the workers, does not help the, the people who, who receive the service. It's all around bad. They only implemented it to make the Postal Service look bad so that they could use that as an argument to privatize it. So, the Postal Service Reform Act has passed the United States House of Representatives. It has now passed the United States Senate, and it goes to President Biden's desk for him to sign, which he has said he supports the bill. He has said he will sign it. And so here again, by the time that you listen to this show, we could see uh, this bill become law. So very good news, uncharacteristically good news right. from D.C. Yeah, I can't remember the last time we had something good coming out of Congress. Yeah. So that's... And the last time that we talked about this, there, there was a comment in the on the YouTube video talking about that, you know, this person was worried that they have snuck a poison pill in here because he's so that they're I don't know that it, it's a not a gendered name. I don't know male or female or non-binary, um, but they said that um, that. Uh, uh, because because how often we get screwed by bipartisan legislation, it was very difficult for them to uh, accept that it was good. But I do believe that it's good because th because it has the strong support, the strong support of every single postal worker union. I believe that if there was a poison pill in this bill, I can't I can't sit here and tell you that I've read the whole thing. Um, I have read analysis of it. I've listened to uh, the workers that are affected by it. And because it has such strong support by the National Association of Letter Carriers, by the American Postal Workers Union, by the rural carriers, by the um, National Postal Mail Handlers Union, because it has such strong support from those unions, I believe that it is at least, at least on balance a good bill.
Um, but I, 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 from everything that I'm reading from it, um, it seems like it's unambiguously good. So, so take that for what it is. Um, and now the last, the last thing that we wanted to talk about was that workers at GMG owned outlets like Jezebel, Gizmodo and The Root went on strike last week and won big time big time. From their press release, they have higher minimum salaries, including $62,000 at the lowest tier in 2022, up from $55,000. So people at the lowest immediately are getting a $7,000 raise. That's pretty cool. With an additional 1000 each year for the life of the contract, a guaranteed 3% annual raise for all unit members, 15 weeks of parental leave, 12 weeks minimum severance, maintaining their current cost-sharing cap for health care, uh, trans-inclusive health care. They defeated management's proposal to give up bargaining rights over changes to health care mid-contract. There is a $45,000 diversity effort budget with audit and transparency. There is a goal of 40% of candidates at the hiring manager interview stage from underrepresented backgrounds, which is very important. They retained the right to speak publicly about working conditions, including social media escalation campaigns. They strengthened editorial independence language. Management must now adhere to both GO Media's editorial policy and and the Society of Professional Journalists' Code of Ethics, and they were able to obtain guarantees against forced relocation for current remote staff. Wow. That's a lot of good stuff. That is a lot of good stuff. Um, and we've seen a lot of this in, in, in the media world, a lot of really good contracts coming out of the media world. And there's, you know... When the strike was happening, there was some, there was some like, you know, capital D discourse happening happening online about you know these people are like privileged or whatever because you know, which doesn't even make sense. I mean, you're talking about people who are making like fifty five thousand dollars a year in New York City, like it doesn't make any sense. Like people have this idea of a, and of course people like this exist, like, you know, the millionaire New York times op-ed writer, but by and large, like people that write for media institutions are just like normal ass folks, right? They are just normal working people making the same thing, oftentimes less than you or me. Um, and, and, and just because they have a lot of people listen to their opinions doesn't mean that they're rich. So be wary of that. Be wary of that instinct that we have to think that, that just because we see somebody on the TV or we see their name in a byline, that means they're rich because it doesn't, unfortunately. I mean, not unfortunately. It's good that, uh, you know, people shouldn't be rich from just saying their opinions. But, um, yeah. but it is unfortunate that they don't make you know even sixty two thousand dollars in new york city that's not a lot of money right that's not a lot of money yeah i mean i think the the bottom line is do they sell their labor for a salary or do they not and you know they don't own these platforms which they should they you know produce content in exchange for a salary uh so they're workers and yep. you know the whole arguments over like who's more you know which workers are more privileged than others i think can you know, that's not to say that there aren't differences. Of course, there are differences between folks who are, you know, writing for Gawker Media versus, uh, you know, or Gizmodo, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, the folks writing for Gizmodo and Jezebel, yeah, they're probably uh, fairly privileged compared to the folks who are working at Walmart and Amazon. I get that. Uh, but they're, you know, they're gradations all throughout the working class. And at the end of the day, you start getting down into that. And it's very easy to divide the working right. class as opposed to focusing on what unites us. We're selling our labor in exchange for wages because we don't own the company. We don't own the whatever means of production that we're participating in. Right. Yeah. Speaking so, speaking of discourse, I saw something on, on Reddit uh, about like where do you think – where where should we say that the middle class begins and it's like the middle the middle class is a useless categorization right totally totally useless it only exists to bifurcate workers to make people think that working people's interests are divergent when we have different salaries um 
which by and large they are not. The interests of a worker making $30,000 at Amazon is the same as a worker making $70,000, uh, you know, at, on on a job site working for a trade union, right? And the interests are they want higher wages, they want more freedom on the job, they want better benefits, they want better protections, they want to, they want good health care, they want to retire with dignity, um, and they want less alienation, uh, more freedom on the job, and less of those things for the boss, right? right? And, and less an actual... control for the boss, more control for you, more right. independence. All of these things every worker wants, every worker deserves, and so all other, you know, all, all other distinctions are by and large, by and large, not useful. Yeah, I, I mean, class is not the same as income. That's why we support the Major League Baseball players, even though some of them are legitimately millionaires. Right. Uh, even the minimum salaries are going to be six figures. I'd love to make what they make, uh, but I support them nonetheless because it's a it's a conflict between employer and employee, between right. owners and workers. And unlike when we're talking about in the private sector where we're talking about uh, about a boss making, you know, every dollar that you that that you make is a dollar that the boss doesn't keep and vice versa unlike that dynamic um it's not that way with the mlb players right like i'm not affected whether or not they make right. five hundred thousand in a year or seven hundred thousand in a year um or or eight hundred or a million in a year right i'm not affected by that and so of course they're the ones that are making uh they're the ones that are responsible for MLB's success, not the owners. The owners, by and large, hurt the industry. And so, of course, the people that do the work should get more of the value that they create. And then we can talk about redistribution after that. Yeah, I, I mean, but you're exactly right, though. Middle class is one of those uh, buzzwords, you know, these phrases that has been used for a very long time now at this point in, in the United States. Uh, to really obscure the class struggle in this country and obscure the class power relations in this country. Um, you know, I, I, I think they have tried to convince about 80, 90 percent of the country to all think they're middle class. And somebody's got to be wrong there. Yeah. Um, you know, class ultimately depends on your relationship to the economy, your relationship to the means of production and how you make a living. If you make your yep. living off wages, you ain't in the same class as the folks who make their living off profits and rents and interest and dividends. That's a whole, you know, there are c competing interests here. You know, three marks. What else can I say? Yeah. Folks, that's going to be it for today's episode of the Valley Labor Report. We appreciate your time. If you would like to help us stay on the air, you can buy our new hat, our Good Things Trucker hat. Uh, you can make a one-time donation or a recurring donation. You can do that all through our site, tvlr.fm. You can navigate to the uh, to our online store and donation page. You can share that on social media. Uh, if you've been watching us on YouTube, be sure that uh, you like the stream you share the stream uh, share the podcast with your friends we are making articles on the website of our clips you can share those um, if you'd like to leave us a voicemail share your thoughts about the contents of today's episode or ask us a question or share a win that you've had in your workplace the phone number is 844-899-TVLR that is 844-899-8857 my name name is Jacob Morrison. My co-host is Adam Keller, and we will see you next week.